Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Um, move to declarations of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof. Seeing none, I'll move to presentations, which we don't have, so we'll skip right through to delegations. We have three delegations this evening for members of the public. First delegation is Dr. Brian Moore of the Moore Chiropractic Group. And Dr. Moore, you will have five minutes. You'll get a warning buzzer at four minutes and then a final buzzer at the end of the five minutes. And uh, again, state your name and address for the record, and you may begin. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for allowing me to address you uh, this evening. My name is Brian Moore of 15,000 Young Street. As you may be aware, I submitted a request for a sign variance that was presented to Council on Tuesday, June 13th, 2017. You may or may not be aware that I was not notified of that meeting by any town official despite submitting a delegation request and that I therefore did not have an opportunity to present to you at that time. The end result was the application was denied and it was suggested to me that rather than request council revisit the denied variance that I address council on a more global scope by requesting the signed bylaw itself be reopened and reevaluated and hence my appearance in front of you this evening. I'm formally requesting the Aurora signed bylaw identified as bylaw number 5840-16 be reopened for discussion including the following. Section 4.10 D through F speaks to the appeals for variance to council. I would like to request council relook at the language in that section to include notification to the applicant when the variance is to be heard in front of council. Section 5.1 speaks to the restriction of types of signs allowed in the town of Aurora. I would like to request council re-examine this component to allow A-frame signage and that the allowance be congruent with the Aurora Promenade streetscape design and implementation plan, page 84, which allows for A-frame signage on the village streets and main streets. I would also request this congruency be expanded to other areas of the town of Aurora. My suggestion is to maintain the A-frame dimensions mentioned in the previous Aurora sign bylaw number 4897-07P and possibly create an annual permit and sticker process to be maintained by the owner, the owner in order to monitor this type of signage. Further, council may consider heritage aspects to the areas and that these A-frame signs would not normally be uh, illuminated. It should be noted in preparing for this evening, I took the opportunity to research the towns in York Region, and in fact many, many Ontario towns. The result became quite clear that Aurora has the most stringent and prohibitive bylaws regarding signage in general, but specifically on A-frame signage of all of the towns researched. To me, it makes it, makes it very unfriendly for, for business in that regard. Section 5.1, I would request council re-examine the mobile sign usage in both R5 and C-zoned properties. Currently, mobile signs are only allowed on commercially zoned properties. Throughout the town of Aurora, there are many businesses located in R5S specialty zone properties that are not allowed a mobile sign, even though their direct neighbor or neighbor across the road, commercially zoned, is allowed. This is a common occurrence on both Young Street and Wellington Street. My suggestion is to realign, realign the allowance of the mobile signs with a promenade study in the Young and Wellington quarters while maintaining the current zoning allowances in other areas. Alternatively, the Young and Wellington quarters could be an exception zone that is treated as commercial for this purpose only. I'm inquiring to council what the process is to allow the Aurora signed bylaw to be reviewed and reopened. Is this something that council can vote on directly or is it to be sent to staff? If this request is to be sent to staff, may I request that staff be directed to review these items and prepare a report within an eight-week time frame, and may, all, may I also request that I be notified of the completion of such a report. Alternatively, if an eight-week time frame is too constrictive, may I request an approval of the variance submitted on June 13, 2017 for 15,000 Young Street by Council until such time as the signed bylaw can be re-evaluated. I'm willing to participate and make myself available to any committee or board involved in the review process. In closing, I'd like to thank Council for allowing me the opportunity to present this evening, and I appreciate your concern to this matter. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, do I have a motion to receive uh, this delegation? Moved by Council Maracas, seconded by Councillor Peary. Are there any comments or questions for the delegate? Oh, 
I always forget. We have Councillor Humphreys first. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for delegating this evening, and uh, I appreciate you bringing forward the concern. Um, in recent months, um, there have been some other businesses with similar concerns, and uh, in particular on industrial, and some of the units behind there, and uh, I know some of my peers have been trying to help uh, that situation as well, and I believe um, there's some great ideas that have been flowing through council members, and I am appreciate you coming forward, and I support the opportunity to look at this again and see how we can help our businesses thrive because uh, you know, this is what this is how you survive and you need that opportunity to, uh, to you know, establish the publishment of your business, what you offer and we need to do that. So uh, I know we're trying to protect um, a lot of the look, you know, the sign pollution, but we also have to understand the importance of businesses and the impact of that. So hopefully we can find a, a better happy medium so I just want to thank you again for coming forward. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Moore, for coming. Um, and I apologize um, for coming in late. I I've, uh, was, uh, and I should tell Council, I've been called away to the hospital all afternoon. I didn't get a chance. Uh, everything seems to be fine, but I may have to leave again. So um, I am I'm moving uh, along those lines. I just thought it was deserving of a, an explanation. Um, you talk about mobile signs. You're talking about A-frame signs. Uh, but then there's a much larger, I'm going to say perhaps six foot by eight foot mobile sign that's that's on wheels and it's a much larger sign. Yes. Uh, okay. And were you talking about the A-frames uh, earlier in your uh, delegation? Correct. Okay, thank you. So, you know, this is something that, that was new. Uh, Dr. Moore and um, and I have seen the experiment and we see them employed elsewhere all throughout cities and and areas throughout the world and not just and uh, I'm all for going towards a review of that so are you asking us to put that forward or, or could you just fill us in has something like that been put forward are you asking council to have that reviewed Dr. Moore uh, what I think I'm asking for it to be to be reviewed by reviewed by council, and if council is able to open the sign bylaw to allow that to be reviewed, I'm not asking for a change in the bylaw tonight. But I'm asking for for council be is is council able to open that sign bylaw and be able to review it? So, uh, Mr. Chair, would that be something I could ask at uh, new business, or was it's not appropriate? To Clerk's advising that it would probably be best as a, a motion brought forward with notice. Well, uh, Dr. Moore, I'll be all in favor of doing that. If, if uh, my colleagues are going to do it, I'll support it. If, if, if they're not put something forward, I'm going to put something forward for you on the, all right, thank you. On the sign bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abel. Any further questions or comments for the delegate? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor of receipt? Opposed? That carries. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore, for coming out. We'll move to our second delegation for the evening, which is uh, Marnie Bunkles. And again, uh, please uh, state your name and address for the record. Your time begins uh, at that moment, and uh, at four minutes you'll get a warning, and at five minutes your time is up. So go ahead. Thank you. Marnie Buckles, 47 Wells Street. Before I begin, I sent pictures. Thank you. And we're going to bring those up. This is the north side of my property, 47 Well Street. And I spoke to this matter in the fall. And I'm back now, thanks to John Abel, for helping me to address this issue and bring forth a motion for resolution. That fence that you're looking at is approximately eight inches from the north side of my property. The posts are over regulation height, and it covers three windows. These notes have also been sent on to a, a few people, including you, Sandra, and I think Tom. Uh, yes, so uh, if it's, thank you for sharing the, uh, with everyone. Um, so as of January 18th, I've had a red tag, actually a few, from Enbridge Gas, and I can't carry out what they want me to do. It is impossible. I have no access to my property. 
first one is tag 296214. I brought them here tonight. Gas piping needs supports and identification. This was all brought down with Enbridge Gas. The second one is tag 296215, fireplace airflow, vent from stove. All of these things must go out the north side of my house, and I have no access. I can't do it. Central York Fire Services, through some, some friends who've been helping, uh, came up with one clause that was important, recommends to prevent death in the event of a fire, make certain there's an escape plan route for each room of the house, and there's an alternate escape route through the window of each room. That is stated. I can't. There's three windows I can't get out of. There's bylaw uh, with respect to property standards. All exterior, and that's bylaw 4044-99P. All exterior surfaces, including surfaces which have been painted, stained, varnished, etc., are to be maintained in a state of good repair. I have no access to the side of my property to do this. I can't look at the vinyl. I can't work on the windows. I can't get at the gas pipe, and neither can Summers and Smith. Ontario Building Code um, says building purpose not required. Uh, for maintenance or repair of fences, it institutes a good neighbor policy where the more attractive side of the fence must face towards the neighboring property and street. There's two violations with this Ontario Code. Uh, first one is the good side doesn't face that way, and there's no ability to maintain. Protect Your Boundaries Association of Ontario Land Survey Surveyors says an encroachment refers to a physical entity that belongs to one landowner. It, two contractors have now measured, you can see the first post. From the middle of that post outwards, the minimum that it seems to encroach on my property is two inches all the way along. Not the fence, but the posts. Landscape design guidelines for the town of Aurora have quoted that lot lined fences will be accordant. Uh, board on board wood fences are not acceptable. This wood fence is board on board. Um, I received an email, I know a, a few of you responded and got this email the last few days, and from Tesha Van Lu and I received, uh, you can remove a fence panel to perform the work you would be responsible for restoring the property to its original condi condition. I can't remove one fence panel. This is not about one fence panel. It's the entire length, and it won't be once. It'll be whenever I have to maintain my property. There was a time when I thought it was my responsibility to remove the fence. I've had some good guidance, some of them in this room in front of me. It's not my responsibility. I didn't, I didn't build it. I can't maintain my property. Seeing out of my windows just makes it a spite fence. That's what it's called. But I can't maintain that property, and it is not my job to take down an existing fence and replace it every time I have to do something. I didn't erect the fence. It's not my responsibility to remove it and rebuild it. I can't access my property. I now have read tags to prove that. The fire code says I'm not in a safe environment. I can't get at windows. I need the town to address this issue and take responsibility for a fence that they have approved to date. Thank you for letting me address you this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Buckles, for your uh, delegation. Uh, Can I get a motion from Council to receive? Moved by Councillor Peary, seconded by Councillor Gartner. Any comments or questions for Ms. Buckles? Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Buckles, I don't even know how to apologize enough for what you've been going through. It's been a, a disaster, and uh, we got to get through this. It's not right. And uh, obviously, you've become very, very familiar with our bylaws and rules and regulations of home property ownership and uh, I hope that we can get to the bottom of this through some way it's just not right so I, I don't accept our apologies but try to work hard to get things changed it looks like there was a bylaw opportunity here to have some uh, restrictions in terms of how close a fence can go to a property line so let's get that moving quickly and see what we can get get done here biggest concern is that you're in danger of a uh, fire hazard and that is not acceptable Um, there is nothing in the bylaw right now but a sideline fence. 
There's nothing. Oh. And I have read in different boroughs that are 1.3 meters, 1.5 meters from a side yard boundary. Mine is right on. But, and you know the situation is in, in uh, the old part of Aurora. I only own eight inches on that side. So if we had had that, that would have been reason alone as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. Councillor Gardner. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry for your trouble. Do you know when your home was uh, erected? About it's, the age of it? It's about almost 130 years old. Thank you. So uh, then th this falls under an area where we didn't have uh, bylaws and zoning in place in those days. So it's, uh, it stands outside the accepted practices perhaps for the town today. So we'll see what we can do about that. 1976 is the survey. <coughs> thank you, Councillor Gardner. Any further comments? Councillor Abel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Buckles, for coming forward. Uh, I do recall when you were here last time and didn't really uh, appreciate the scope uh, and the effects of what had gone and transpired. Uh, the, the fence um, it's not your responsibility. I mean, you're not responsible for that in any way being there. So now, uh, as I understand, you need to service uh, your Enbridge gas and for any other reason that any other property owner would have mm -hmm. to, to move around their house to, in order to service it and, and go on their property. Um, but you've been told to remove it yourself and then replace it. And so now it becomes your responsibility at your time and cost. And of course, that would require you to be on the property of your neighbor, and that puts you in, a, in my mind, a vulnerable position because now uh, you have to have an understanding with your neighbor of exactly what you're doing, and there could be some confusion there. I mean, I, th I think, I don't think you should be taking on that as well um, because it puts yourself in a vulnerable position, in, in my opinion. Um, so uh, I have moved forward with a notice of motion. Hopefully uh, it will address the gap. I think in our bylaw, when we did all the setbacks in 76 and whenever they were done, we should have stated very simply where there aren't the normal setbacks, then they would have to be handled individually before anything could be done. Um, did you notice uh, before any posts can be dug in, in Aurora, there's something called a um, uh, one call and uh, those in the construction know that that is a service that is mandated by any contractor to uh, call before they put uh, any shovel into the ground at least they sever any um, hydro lines cable lines phone lines or natural gas lines instinctively I would be looking at the natural gas pipe along there and thinking perhaps I should do that did you notice anyone on your property there uh, and it's you can't miss it because they usually mark it and there's paint all along there uh, when this was being constructed did you see any of that paint so that, that was part of the many notes Pardon? go ahead oh sorry um, no there was one post there was only one post on my property it was done when I wasn't home so it was half completed or three quarters of completed when I got home and I was just in a state of shock so I went out with people and looked there's nothing on my property you would have, you would have noticed several colors and no. it would have been all the way down to the road because uh, they, sh they show where it starts on the road and how it moves in and they're color-coded for different depths and different cables so if none of that was there it also seems intuitive to me that a contractor would know right away uh, setbacks before they would proceed with anything. Uh, did you notice the contractor, the name of the contractor when he was doing it? No. It was I, I certainly saw him, one man alone, uh, no truck, no card. Uh, it was, it was an, an amazing experience to have someone fencing you in, in your own house. So wouldn't uh, speak to me, the neighbor wouldn't speak to me, they just finished the work. Councillor Abel? So it, it seems to me that um, the person responsible for hiring that person would be responsible for any and all, uh, uh, you know, they'd be, they would be responsible for everything because they didn't do a normal contract or they didn't well, do the Councillor Abel, I'm not sure we know a right, full well, story. I'm just saying you'd... I'm trying to just, through her questions, just surmise okay. what was going on. So I'm just concluding. But the neighbor isn't here to give the, a, a differing opinion if there I'm is just, one. So I'm, I'm just... Not, 
I'm just saying a okay. contractor would normally Go ahead. do the, the a normal contractor would know that those aren't setbacks and would also know that they would require the uh, digging uh, clearance from the, the service for underground. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Buckles. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abel. Councillor Peary? Can we put that one picture back up? There's more pictures, too. Would you mind showing all of them, sure. please? I sent five. I, this is the this is the picture I, I'd like to see. Okay. Um, there's a dog in the mm -hmm. picture. Uh, it's it's, I would presume your neighbor's dog. Yeah. Um, this seems like an awful lot of work for somebody to have to go through to put up a fence. Yes. To keep a dog safe mm -hmm. and within their own property. Mm -hmm. um, was there ever a discussion to, to bridge that gap, between the fence and your house? Never. What happened? I appreciate you bringing that because I did address that in the fall but I didn't tonight uh, I actually came out to a noise that's all it was and that is back I don't remember sorry somewhere in the summer and there was a gentleman out there about to put up that black gate and I simply said you might need to look at measurements because I know this property I own about eight inches a very very volatile reaction from the neighbor and never spoke again and the next time I came home there was a wooden fence I, I, I agree with um, our chair tonight. The neighbor's not here to defend themselves, so I would, I would not describe the way that they were acting. They might say that they were acting very differently. I just want to deal with the facts. So was there ever a conversation then, um, prior to this being put up, to bridge that gap? Yes, it would have gone over your, your property line, but it would have also you know, kept the dog within their property, more or less. And, I'm just trying to figure out what another reasonable solution to this would have been. So my, there was never a conversation then with you, okay? And see if I have the allotment time to do this. There's uh, down the driveway, there's a very, very large uh, garage. It's entirely possible that something like this could have been built just on a smaller scale, wouldn't have affected windows, wouldn't have covered anything, wouldn't have been a problem. That's just one idea. But it's currently built on the lot line. We think so. I have not done a survey yet myself. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Peary. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Ms. Buckles, for being here. And just, just quickly, um, do you feel that for your part, you've tried your best to work this situation out with your neighbor? prior to coming to us? I do, and I continue to. I, I've been told by various people, we'll get a motion, you know, get a, give her a letter, sign, she never gets back to me, or that is my impression, is that I'm never responded to. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Um, seeing no further uh, members of council that would like to uh, ask you a question or have a comment, I'll call the vote on receipt. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Buckles, for coming out. We'll move to our final delegation for the evening, uh, Mr. Bob Lepp. Um, Mr. Lepp, you have five minutes. You'll get a warning at four. And again, you have to state uh, your name and address, and your time begins when you do so. Uh, Bob Lepp, 227 Orchard Heights, Aurora, and they've got a link on YouTube, and I'm not going to talk. Oh, wrestling? It's 5.03 on YouTube. That's not it. <laughs> Can you make it full screen? There you go. Do we have sound? You'll have to restart. I was told not to bring this on data that they would be able to do it directly. So. That's the uh, speaker symbol on the bottom left.
one moment, please, when we, while we try to figure this out. Mr. Lepp, hold on one second, please. Mr. Mr. Lepp, Mr. Lepp, please hold on a second. Please hold on a second before you play that so we can sort it through. Mr. Lepp, are you just going to play the audio uh, without the video? Okay. So again, please, that's fine. Please state your name and address, and you now have five minutes. I did. I already stated my name and address. Great. Then, then you can continue. Okay, so you guys are going to tell me when you're ready to go? Or? Let's just try it here. Good evening. My name is Bob Lepp. Oh, that'll work. Uh, as, as you know, I'm an advocate for... So you're going to start the video, right? Mr. Lepp, I think just play the audio you have. I don't know if we're going to be able to synchronize video to your iPad. Yeah, and it'll be fine. If she starts the video, it'll be fine. I think just begin your delegation would be great in the interest of everyone here so we can conduct the business of the town in a timely fashion. So she'll begin the video, please begin the audio, and you have five minutes. <coughs> you may begin right now. Uh, okay, you're gonna tell me when you're gonna click? Ready, one, two, three. Good evening, my name is Bob Lepp. Uh, as, as you know, I'm an advocate for the dog park in Aurora, and that's how I got started doing blogging about various issues in the town of Aurora. This was the condition of the Canine Commons dog park before I got involved. I was able to bring embarrassing pressure to the town so that Al Downey had to completely renovate Canine Commons, but it was built backwards, they used all the wrong fasteners, and it was not made accessible. But despite having an accessibility committee look at his previous work, at Queen's Jubilee Park, which was made completely accessible. Not one single inch of Canine Commons was made accessible. Ontario disability laws state clearly that Canine Commons should have been made completely accessible as part of its complete renovation. It was not. So today, anyone with a service dog in the town of Aurora has absolutely no place to run that dog and exercise it. This is the bus stop at the Our Lady of Grace School. In a project this spring, I blogged against the bizarre experiment of removing all the no parking signs at an elementary school and just letting the parents park wherever they want. We have a point of order. Please it pause your presentation, Mr. Failure. Lepp. M Mr. Lepp, please pa pause your presentation. We have a point of order. Pl kill the mic. Please stop your presentation. We have a point of order on your presentation, Mr. Lepp. A point of privilege raised by the mayor. Point of privilege, Mr. Mayor. The clerk does not censor. That is totally inappropriate. Excuse me, Mr. Lepp. I'm chairing the meeting, so your point of privilege is for... I think we should kill this. It's just not appropriate. Mr. Mayor is uh, suggesting that the point of privilege is that the... I'm willing to put it to a vote of council. On, on subjecting Mr. Lepp's uh, presentation to be stopped. It's not appropriate, yeah. 
Is there a seconder for that? Before we can comment on that motion, uh, I'd like a seconder. If there is no seconder, then I will rule that, uh, um, while I believe that it's in poor taste, uh, this has been approved by the clerk to be shown. And if you have any comments uh, on the presentation, that they can be made after. But if there is a seconder for Mayor Dawes' uh, motion, then we will have comments. It is seconded by Councillor Thompson that the delegation be uh, stopped. And I'll take comments from committee uh, on that motion. Councilor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we've all had an, actually an opportunity to, to review this, this tape, I believe. This is new? OK. Well, well, I'd say maybe there might be some slight changes. But, but in my opinion, I, I believe that this presentation made by the delegate, delegate includes statements that are best wild accusations that are not supported by the facts. And, but worse, the delegate has made statements that impugn the integrity of named staff, which is completely unacceptable. And so therefore, I'll support stopping this. Thank you, Councillor Maracas. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Um, the delegate was good enough to send around the presentation previously, and then I viewed it. Um, and to your point about the clerk viewing it, I think Mayor Daw is raising the point that there's been a new slide inserted into this presentation, which specifically names other staff members as well as our clerk, and makes a number of comments which I didn't have a chance to read fully through, but I, I am concerned about it. He's been come to the council before and asked not to bring that issue with that staff person here before because those charges were not a town issue. And that was the advice of our solicitor. And so because this presentation was not completely vetted and has been changed, I'll support Mayor Dawes' motion. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, we pride ourselves in being an open council to listen, but it's unbelievable that you would put individuals' names in in that way with no opportunity for people. Doesn't matter. I'm, I, it doesn't me, matter. I'm, I'm just making my comment. It would be a lot more well respected if there's some issues brought forward in a business or actually residential type fashion for support and not pointing that way. It's not appropriate. It doesn't get you anywhere. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. Are there any further comments to the motion that the uh, delegation be stopped at this point? Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, council has a motion before that we have to address. If there's no further comments by members of council, I'll call the vote. Uh, it's G GC. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. Councilor Gardner. Well, I agree with the comments that have been said already, but um, was that followed that the name was taken out and it's been put in in error by the town Do you, could you comment to that i'm sorry I'm, yeah, I'm not for clarification for clarification mr lip yes okay was that there. slide included in the original video that was presented yes the mr uh, clerk mr clerk excuse me sir the slide was included uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the slide was included and we asked that the, um, the face of a young woman be covered up or removed um, completely because we didn't know the circumstances in which uh, it was the photo was taken. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Councillor Gartner. So, so as a follow-up, the, a staff person's name was mentioned in this video that we received? Yeah, so so um, I have to agree with the Mayor. That's against our policy to... Um, to say anything about a staff member because they have no ability to defend themselves in open council. Uh, no, it's not. Excuse me. Excuse you, me I'm sir. sorry, Excuse Mr. Lapp, but I, I know that you're very passionate about this, and I thank you for the work you've done to make this better. But we have to hold the line there. We cannot have a staff member criticized at open council. Excuse me, sir. No, no, no. Excuse me, sir. We're discussing the motion on the floor. If it's defeated, you'll be allowed to resume your delegation. If council votes not to, I'll ask you to take your seat. But we will conduct the business uh, moving forward in that regard. Councillor Gardner, do you have any more comments? No. Thank you. Councillor Abel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I, 
I reviewed the, um, uh, Mr. Lepp did send it to us and, and it was addressed to the clerk, could he show it? Uh, I had my thoughts that if, if you're delegating, you're delegating on an item on the agenda. And I, I, my comment then was we were covering a number of items as well as the delegation on, on the fence bylaw, which is what I thought you were talking about, but you, you cover another of other items. So if it was just the part on the fence bylaw, I would have had no issue. I was surprised when it did go through and that comment wasn't done. We could have, we could, you know, that, I would prefer it was just based on the fence bylaw and not a review of everything that's gone on. So to the point, I can't support the delegation because it doesn't pertain to the item on the agenda. And I'm, guess, I'm just giving an explanation why I would support the motion before us. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Abel. Are there any more comments from Council regarding this? Councillor Peary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I missed what everyone is talking about. Um, I grabbed a coffee, I came back. Um, the mayor I, I, no 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 I was I was here for that part okay but I, I'm I missed what what uh, mr. mayor and everyone else around the council table um, was referring to uh, I just I take what the comments made around the table to heart and and I assume that it's um, as bad but I'll be honest I, I missed them so uh, I appreciate the comments thank you are there any further comments from members of council regarding the motion on the floor Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor of the mayor's motion? All those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Lepp, please take your seat. Mr. Lepp, unfortunately, the will of council was that the delegation not move forward. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Mr. Lepp, the ship has sailed. The council's made a motion that you uh, retake your seat and that your delegation has, will not move forward at this point. Um, thank you, Mr. Lepp. Um, we will move to the consent agenda. There are nine items on the consent agenda. Does anyone have any comments or questions to items on the consent agenda? Please raise them at this time. Councilor Maracas. You're going to have to bear with me. I can't see my name because my screen's not working, so. It's all you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, C2. You'd like that to discuss C2? I, I have a few questions. Um, in, in if they're minor, I'll let you add them now. If you think that you'd like to discuss it separately or amend the motion, then I'll have you maybe do that. I'd, I'd move it to the regular agenda. Okay, C2 then. to the regular agenda. Any further uh, comments or questions or items that need to be discussed in, at further length? Councillor Kim. C1. Councilor Gardner, C1 and C2 have been um, pulled for a more thorough discussion. Are there any other items you'd like uh, to ask questions or comments or to be uh, moved to the regular agenda? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was listening, uh, but I think there are residents in the audience, and I would appreciate I believe they're here for Council Marox's motion. So uh, I would, or, or sorry, the report from staff on that uh, motion. So uh, could we? discuss that first even if we pull forward C's yeah I, I would imagine that it, we Thank would you. move the C's perhaps to after R9 or R10 and R11 make them R10 and R11 Thank you. and we'll begin with the regular agenda as uh, circulated is there any other comments or questions from members of council seeing none then uh, I'll have a motion to move forward um, C3 to C9 can I get someone to move that motion Moved by Councillor Maracas. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Peary. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. So we'll move now to the regular agenda. And regular agenda item R1 is the interim control bylaw. Do I have uh, someone who wants to move the staff recommendation? Councillor Maracas, seconder? Do I have a seconder for this? I do not have a seconder for the staff recommendation. Oh, Councillor Humphreys. Um, comments or questions to item R1? Councillor Gartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and there were some questions from the audience, uh, not part of our 
uh, regular agenda, but I think that for clarification, the interim control bylaw does address uh, one of the problems, which is granting extra height and massing for a home, and I know that's a problem on some of the streets in the stable neighborhoods. Um, and I think the way it's worded, we will allow residents to put additions on their home. Uh, we're, that's not what we're trying to stop here. We're trying to stop the even larger builds. Um, but from what some of you are asking, it does not prevent a developer from knocking down an existing home and creating something that does not fit in with the neighborhood and uh, as it says in our official plan causes an uh, sorry adverse impact to the the neighborhood so the, the, the I guess in plain English um, the zoning bylaw that exists will continue to allow the very large homes, some of you are calling them monster homes or neighborhood busting homes, that will continue until council is able to look at the current zoning bylaws and see if they fit in with our official plans protective policies for older neighborhoods. I do not believe that they do and uh, hopefully council will say that we need to do more to protect the neighborhoods and I believe the majority of people are here tonight are talking about protecting their neighborhoods. So uh, this is a first step but until we actually look at the zoning bylaws that exist and decide how are we going to change these, you will not have any increased protection. And that's why the timing issue is very important. As someone said, well, two things uh, about we have to try not to miss entirely this building season. And um, will this be done before the next election? Uh, before the election, before this council stops sitting, which will be in September? And those are questions, that second question certainly can't be answered at the moment. Uh, but I know it's of concern to residents. Um, I think that's all I have to say for the moment. I, 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 I'm in favor of, of the interim control bylaw, but if you're here because you're, you're wanting to know if it's going to protect you, maybe a little bit, but, but, but not in any substantial way. So I'm sorry if you've waited all this time to, <laughs> to find that out. Thank you. And thank you for those who spoke. Thank you, Councilor Gardner. Councilor Peary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, getting back to the, the questions, um, the first question that I, I heard from the residents is what applies? Uh, which zoning bylaw, which official plan? Um, so through you to Mr. Ramuno, uh, what current zoning bylaw um, and official plans do we have on, on file and when were those approved? Mr. Muno? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, our current official plan is the uh, uh, September 20th, uh, September 2010, adopted by uh, uh, Council or our Council and approved by the Region in 2011. And uh, as you know, our new comprehensive zoning bylaw was enacted by Council June of 2017. Councilor so I, I think that answers the first question. Um, an additional question I have is um, our new official plan. When are we anticipating that coming? Mr. Ramuno. Through you, Mr. Chair. Our new OP update, and um, you know, as we reported to the Council, we need to wait for the region to complete their uh, regional official plan update. That's expected to occur um, in the spring of 20, 2020. Um, and then we can follow with uh, um, our final official plan update shortly after the region approves theirs. So 20, late 2020, 2021. Councilor Perry? Uh, the next question was with regards to bylaw timing. Um, so through you to Mr. Ramuno, uh, Marco, what's your anticipated timeline for all of this to move forward so that all the residents here in, in 
um, council chambers uh, are aware. Mr. Amuno. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I am planning to have a report uh, in response to council's uh, uh, direction to review the stable, stable neighborhood policies and uh, zoning permissions, um, hopefully uh, uh, for the March cycle, early April at the latest. Councilor Perry. And then from there, enactment would be a couple weeks later or, or significantly longer than that. Marco. Do you, Mr. Uh, Chair, I will provide some uh, report with some, some options for council. Um, if if uh, the direction of council is to proceed with changes to the existing uh, zoning bylaw, that would require uh, uh, formal changes to the zoning bylaw, which would entail a uh, formal public hearing. Uh, to, um, um, uh, to provide that opportunity for the public um, and then pr proceeding towards enactment of uh, a bylaw that would incorporate any changes that council directs staff to uh, uh, to prepare. Councillor? I think those were the, the questions that were um, asked. Um, I'll state my, my position now. Um, because of the new zoning bylaw and the rules surrounding zoning bylaws that have come in place for the next two years, no one is able to come to uh, our, our council to ask that any changes to the zoning bylaw be made for residential homes. In addition to that, um, people can currently come and ask for amendments to, uh, sorry, minor variances to our zoning bylaws. Um, and so that would be something where they're requesting for uh, an allowance to go from 10, 10 meters to 11 meters. So to build over and above the standards that currently exist within our zoning bylaws. Um, putting this in place would prohibit somebody to come from ask, as Councilor Gartner had stated, would stop somebody from coming forward and say, I'd like to go from, from 10 meters to 11 meters or the rules say that I can only build a shed um, a meter and a half away from, from my property line, but in this special circumstance, I'd like it to be a little bit closer than that, and these are the reasons why. Um, so moving forward with an interim control bylaw would, by and large, um, prevent people from asking for those types of changes, um, but it would have absolutely no impact on zoning. Um, if we go through another uh, zoning bylaw change now, when we've only just approved in June of 2017 uh, our, our most recent zoning bylaw, um, I can anticipate likely a lot more appeals um, to that, and that would again slow down the whole process. Um, we're currently telling people, from what I've heard, there's a request. Uh, to not only tell people that you have to build by, all, by our standards, but now we're changing to say, uh, or there's a request that we change to say, you can't even build to our standards. We're going to put a stop to that. Um, that's the request over and above what we're doing here today. So I think that this is a, a good first step, but I agree with Councillor Gartner that this isn't going to solve everyone's problems. And I personally intrinsically believe that people have property rights. So we've set out some rules and some regulations to say, this is our zoning bylaw. These are the, the, the standards that you have to live up to. And I think as a municipality, we've set those rules. Um, and to now turn around and say that, that uh, you can't even build to our standards, um, it's not something that I agree with. So I'm in favor of moving forward with, with what we have uh, in front of us here today. That will ensure that our rules and our regulations are being abided by. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I'd be willing to go much further. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Before I go to Councillor Kim, who's next to speak, uh, Mr. Ramuna, I have a question based on something that Councillor Peary just asked. Would a one meter increase in height be considered a minor variance? Yeah. Mr. Ramuna? Um, to you, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, yes, when it comes okay. to a specific standard, it'd be a variance. Thank you. Councillor Kim, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't want to talk to the, to the main issue of uh, the Stable Neighborhoods uh, motion, which Ms. Uh, Councillor Gardner uh, has put forth, which staff will bring back a report uh, in a couple of months or sooner. Um, 
but for this particular motion, the interim control bylaw, um, I'll be in support. Uh, I think in general, myself, the interim control bylaw is 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 a is a heavy tool to to use for uh, zoning measures. But given that uh, really it's not restricting uh, uh, construction uh, based on the current bylaw, uh, I'm fine with that. Uh, but I did want to speak to to uh, one of the questions that uh, the resident, uh, one of the residents asked d during the presentation. Uh, Councillor Peary did address uh, most of that. But I just wanted to ask uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, to Mr. Ramuno, uh, the question about the one year duration and that will end in the next council. So are there any uh, perceived or real downstream impacts from this uh, traversing from one term to another? Mr. Ramuno. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, the Planning Act does provide the uh, council uh, can utilize that uh, the tool of an interim control bylaw. Um, and it could be for any given amount of time up to one year. And there's the option for council to even extend it to a, 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 to a, a two year term. But as it's currently drafted, it, it would uh, be for a one-year period, which would extend it to uh, you know January of 2019. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marino. Um Myself, you know, given that it's up to one year, or when staff comes back with the report, I'm assuming that the staff will be coming back with the report uh, uh, well in advance of the one year. So uh, I am in support of the interim control bylaw. Um, and again, I have to ask, uh, in the interim control bylaw itself, uh, from your experience through other municipalities' experiences, uh, have there been any unintended consequences that you're aware of? Mr. Ramuno. Through you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, again, the intent of the bylaw is to freeze development um, uh, for a given period to allow t uh, the municipality to review its policies and zoning permissions. Uh, the way the bylaw is crafted, uh, as per council's direction, it would allow development to occur provided an applicant is in keeping with the current uh, zoning standards within those defined areas of town. Uh, so that really the only impact would be if uh, a property owner has, is looking to uh, exceed those zoning provisions for whatever reason, whether it be an addition or a new build or a, uh, an accessory structure. Um, in, in that event, of course, they would be subject to the freeze unless council uh, uh, would allow, a, and it council has the ability to allow um, exemptions to the interim control bylaw. And that would mean um, another bylaw would need to be enacted, considered by council to um, consider removing any, a given parcel from the uh, uh, defined area. And that's also an option. Thank you, Mr. Romano. Um, Given that uh, this interim control bylaw, if it passes this evening, uh, shouldn't last beyond you know two, three, four months uh, when the report's uh, ready, uh, I'm ready to vote uh, to approve the motion. And uh, you know, if Councillor uh, Marakis is willing to bring it down to a six-month duration and keep it within our uh, term, uh, I'd happily vote for that too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kim. Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I would just like to point out that um, the, um, I guess it's the director, excuse me, senior manager policy of build uh, sent for circulation uh, to council uh, through the clerk, which we received. And the request was that this be made part of the public record. So I was wondering uh, through you, Mr. Chair, would it be appropriate that this be received as a memorandum? I thought it might be on our uh, additional items today before um, before us here at general committee. Um, I'm not sure. Obviously, it wasn't included, uh, but is it possible to have that included as a memorandum attached to this item as we move to council next week? It, the clerk is indicating it uh, at the request of a council member. It can be added as a memorandum to the council agenda. Uh, right, that makes sense. I could have requested that by email earlier. So um, I would make that request that it be uh, uh, received as a memorandum for next week's council. Great. Any other comments, Councillor Abel? Um, no. No, I've got no other comments. 
Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Gardner for a second time, but I'm going to go to Councillor Thompson first. Councillor Thompson. Oh, the mic. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome back. Thank you. Um, my question is really to Mr. Ramuno. Um, you know, a lot of uh, my comments have already been uh, echoed by um, my colleagues around the table with regards to, um, you know, enforcing our current standards. Uh, but Clause 3, I just want to explore a little bit. You know, it, it speaks about uh, those exceptions coming to Council for decision about whether or not to um, allow them to go forward in the process. We've seen that uh, through the whole zoning bylaw uh, process that we've gone through recently, and, and it's posed some challenges. So my question through you to Mr. Ramuno. Mr. Ramuno, if Council decides, is it possible for you and or staff to make that decision about uh, what... Um, uh, minor variances should be allowed and then if so how would that process work mr. Muno could you give us a bit more of an explanation please certainly <clears throat> through you mr. chair um, to council Thompson um, there that option does exist for council to um, um, allow for exe uh, exemptions um, it's really a twofold process uh, and and there's no uh, right or wrong order um, but two things do need to happen. Um, one is uh, that if council or, or if council de delegates to staff the ability to consider a, a variance application, to allow that to continue on to the committee of adjustment. Uh, eventually, um, the interim control bylaw, as you know, as currently drafted, it's not before council, but it will be bef uh, before council next week. Um, that would have to be amended uh, uh, by council. A new bylaw would have to be enacted to. Um, exempt a given property or more than one property from the bylaw. Um, so that could happen first, or uh, council could direct staff to uh, use their discretion to allow what staff believe to be a, a minor uh, variance to proceed through to the Committee of Adjustment. Uh, but again, ultimately, prior to that applicant um, being allowed to submit a building permit, uh, the interim control bylaw would have to be amended if their property is currently covered by the, uh, uh, the interim control bylaw. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. And I think, you know, and I'll, I'll listen to the comments around the table from other colleagues, but, um, you know, the exemption really is, uh, as the report states, for those obvious um, circumstances where it makes sense. And, you know, I'm comfortable in trusting staff to make that decision because ultimately, as Mr. Ramuno said, it's still coming back to us for a final decision to exempt it from the bylaw. So I don't think we need to see it twice and make the decision twice, in my opinion. Um, I think that uh, we can obviously trust our staff that they understand the issue that uh, around the table and what council's intent is here and they can make that initial call and then obviously it still comes back to us for a final approval if there is an issue then we can address it um, and so you know my preference would be to amend clause 3 uh, to give staff that initial authority to make that call uh, but I'll listen to my colleagues around the table and see if anybody else shares that uh, perspective Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Mr. Ramuno, I have a question arising out of uh, Councillor Thompson's remarks, and that is, so if, if staff were delegated authority to, uh, at the initial stages of, say, allowing a minor variance application, it would then go to the Committee of Adjustment as it would normally go, and then the Committee of Adjustment, assuming they, they granted the minor variance, then Council would have to approve it as well as an amendment to the Interim Control Bylaw. Is that, do I have that sequence of events correct? To you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, yes, uh, except the very last part. Um, if the Committee of Adjustment uh, considers an application and they were to approve a variance, um, the ap application the applicant would have a variance, but then I would need to bring forward a, uh, a amending interim control bylaw uh, for Council to uh, remove a given property from the, the interim control bylaw. So it wouldn't be subject to the freeze, and then the applicant that could then proceed to submit a building permit and and they would no longer be part of the uh, 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 freeze. Thank you. So the then at, at that point in time, let's say they decide they want to add a massive addition onto their house and they're now their property is exempt from the interim control bylaw and they come and they reapply to the town for something else. Is that a way around the interim control bylaw if we allow the exception? 
to you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chair. Uh, no, again, if Council approves a, a interim control bylaw which suspends development, um, you know, we, it, it essentially freezes building permits. So if, if an applicant decides to change their, their proposal, um, they would likely require a, uh, another variance application and they would have to, you know, resubmit. I mean, the direction would be clear from Council that if an interim control bylaw is in place, development is suspended for, for that given period of time. Thank you. Mayor Daw, you're next, and then I'll go back to Councilor Gartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll answer you to Mr. Romano. So a bit of a preference to my question here. So our first house in Aurora was in Regency Acres, and about a million years ago, I think. Um, and it was slightly less than 1,000 square feet on a 50 by 100 foot lot. Uh, so we had probably slightly less than 20% lot coverage because there was no uh, garage. So I could, under our current official plan, and notwithstanding um, if, if this interim control bylaw report was to pass, I could come in and apply for a demolition permit for my old house. And based on 35% lot coverage, which is in our official plan, or in the zoning, zoning bylaw to, to conform to the official plan, thank you, I could build a 2,600 square foot two-story house with a single car garage with a building permit. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Amuno. Through you, through you Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, that's correct, provided you comply with those existing zoning provisions. And they're, they're, they're pretty standard provisions 10 meter height, 35% lot coverage, five foot side yard setback, rear yard setbacks. Yep. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, so I could do that, like I say, uh, just by coming in and asking and applying for a demolition permit and a building permit. Uh, so with no variation, I could build what would probably be considered uh, a monster house in that neighborhood, especially if no other houses on the street had gone through that process. Uh, so quite frankly, oh, the uh, second question um, through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Romero. Roughly how many houses, uh, house developments uh, come forward on a yearly basis on average uh, that would exceed so I have to go through a variance, you know, uh, size, height, um, side, rear, setback, roughly. Mr. Amuno? Through you, Mr. Uh, Mayor. I did look at the past four years, and we have been seeing uh, approximately six to seven uh, variance applications uh, for uh, new builds um, or significant additions that required variances to the existing zoning. In, in, the, in the three particular areas, uh, that are in front of council this evening as part of that uh, interim control bylaw, about six or seven per year over the last four years. So Mr. Thank, Mayor. thank you very much, Mr. Romano. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, um, uh, much ado about nothing. We have six to eight houses a year, uh, and for that, we're going through this uh, gyration of interim control bylaw. I think what we need to be doing is going back and what the region is doing uh, and under the provincial guidelines is looking at our entire official plan and how we would move forward that way. If we truly want to protect our stable neighborhoods, we have to look at it from a holistic point of view. Uh, this is not going to get us what, what I suspect a lot of people in the audience are looking for or what, they've, what they, they feel might be happening. That is not going to get it for them. Um, it might be a start, it might not. I think that's up to the individual person to uh, determine. Uh, and lastly, I'll point out that uh, uh, Council may remember that some people on this council were aghast that we might actually uh, forward um, a budget recommendation to the 2019 Council because it would go over a term. Uh, and that was just a recommendation to look at something. Uh, so you might want to consider that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And no, I do not support it. Thank you, Mayor Daw. I have Councilor Maracas for the first time. And then finally, we'll get to Councilor Gartner, who's been waiting patiently <laughs> for uh, her second opportunity to speak. Uh, but I'll go to Councilor Maracas first. Councilor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I'm, I sat back, I'm listening to my colleagues and some of the concerns and some of the questions. Um, we are looking at a holistic approach of this. We're, we're doing a study. And that study is going to look at how we can better protect our stable neighborhoods. The interim control bylaw is to be put in place to make sure while that study is happening that no one 
can come forward and ask for changes from what is allowed currently. And what is allowed within a minor variance for everyone to understand? Severed lots is a minor variance. This would stop that for the time being. So a developer could come in and ask for a severed lot and this interim control bylaw would stop that. So when I hear that this is much to do about nothing, that is to me, uh, really, there's no facts when it comes to that. <laughs> you know, when we look at protecting our stable neighborhoods, we need to look to do what we can. And I think taking this approach is a, is a, is a good first step and then combining it with the study is when it will come back and we can take that look and decide how we're going to move forward. So we are doing it the proper way and this is the proper way to do it. So uh, I'm in full support of this and I think that this is the way to go forward. And I know next week we'll probably see a little bit more from the development community come forward and their objections to this. Um, but uh, I'm not here to uh, please the development community. I'm here to please the residents of this community and the town. Thank you, Councillor Maracas. Councillor Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Two quick points. Yes, we did just look at our zoning bylaw. We spent years looking at it, I think three. But nowhere during that time did we look at the zoning bylaws for the older neighborhoods of town. And uh, I think we were remiss. And I think all these people who are sitting here, um, well, it's affected them adversely. And uh, Mr. Mono and I will have a disagreement, but in the Planning Act, it does say that three years after an official plan is uh, confirmed by a council, that the council must amend all zoning bylaws in effect in the municipality to ensure that they conform with the official plan. Now, we didn't do that. There are reasons why we didn't do that. But I believe we should have looked at section six, protecting stable neighborhoods section. We should have uh, come to the public. We should have said, listen, this is what our official plan said. We want to help you. What do you want us to do with the zoning bylaws? We never did that. So we're going to do it now. Um, there is something incorrect in this uh, agenda item R1. It says that on December 12th, the resolution directing council to conduct a study to review zoning, uh, review zoning provisions and regulations regarding infill houses in stable neighborhoods. In fact, that was passed by this council on October 24th and we are now three months into the process and nothing has been done and the building season is going to start. And you know, six or seven or eight, I'm thinking in the last year, Mr. Um, I'm thinking in the last year, probably there have been more, uh, an increase in large homes being built in stable neighborhoods. So let's say you have eight or nine or 10 and one of those homes is next to you, beside you, behind you, that's just one too many homes. Um, so from what I can see from this um, item, we are being asked to uh, approve a terms of reference through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Muno. We are being asked to re review and approve a terms of reference for a study, so I'm assuming that the study hasn't begun yet, and council is being asked to approve the terms of reference, and the last line is that the council will be presented uh, with this report in June. Um, I'd like clarification on that, but I can say June, July, August, um, we stop sitting in perhaps the middle of September, this may not get done this year for this building season. It may not get done in this council. Uh, it will go to the next council and we will miss another building season. So I am asking um, Mr. Through you, Mr. Chair to Mr. Muno, and I'm asking my fellow councillors what we can do to help these people to really help them is to, to start looking at this now. 
we can we can hold a public meeting and ask the public what they would like to see in their zoning bylaws. We can ask ourselves what would we want to see in zoning bylaws if we lived in a stable neighborhood and I don't believe any of us do except for Councillor Tom. Um, we, we just can't delay. It's, it's not acceptable. We're, we're here to protect the residents. We, we can't delay anymore with the protection. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, could I have a comment about the terms of reference um, and also uh, the report coming back in June? Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mono, do you have an answer for that? I know that Clause 4 talks about that staff be directed to undertake a study. Uh, and, and that we, they'd be directed to present a, or that an interim control bylaw be enacted as part of the clauses for R1, but could you possibly reiterate the timelines uh, associated with that? Certainly, to you, Mr. Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, Council Gardner is uh, correct. I mean, Actually, I, I did receive a uh, original direction back in October to undertake a, uh, a review of our land use policies and zoning permissions. Uh, staff is working on putting together some background research, and I have committed to uh, uh, to the CAO and Council earlier this evening that we, we're going to uh, do our best to have that report before Council um, earlier than June, March, or early April. Um, the reason um, we were asking Council to include a, uh, you know, uh, terms of reference as part of this interim control bar law is that we're required under the Act um, uh, for Council to enact interim control by law. Uh, there is a requirement to under undertake a, uh, a, a land use study um, as part of that interim control by law. Notwithstanding, I do have direction from Council dating back to October and staff are working towards uh, a review of our policies and zoning permissions and we'll have something to Council uh, uh, early in the spring. And Councilor Gardner, I'm just going to give you a heads up that you have 19 seconds remaining in your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and then I would ask, and I saw Mr. Muno nodding his head, I would ask that Council, I would like to make a motion that we at least start with a public open house to get feedback from the public to see what it is about the zoning bylaws that they would like to see changed. Thank you, Councilor Gardner. Is that a motion or? That is a motion if someone would like to could second we, it. Sorry, could you repeat the motion, please? Uh, or it could be an amendment. I amendment, Mr. Clerk. I'm not sure how that would go. Are you amending what's on the screen? Okay. So when would I make that motion? I suggest perhaps a notice of motion. Oh uh, no! Excuse me, Mr. Chair. I don't want to do a notice of motion. Should just make a motion before the, we get to the next item. That? Councillor Humphreys, I would suggest that we deal with the item on the floor, unless you're going to make an amendment, and then after we we vote on each item, item R1, a motion can be tabled at that time. Thank you. So it, so it won't be number five. We, we wouldn't just we add would, a number five to this. Before we'll we do addressed it. item R2, you could make a motion that Council could consider at that time. It's too thank substantive you for a general, for um, Thank you. And although I know you, thank you. I, although I know you're using a crutch, I am not Councillor Humphreys. <laughs> oh, did I say that? <laughs> it's been a while since I've been back, so apologies, Councillor Gardner. I'll get it right before Well, the you the know you're not the first one. It's only so. our third year on council. And it's so. a compliment, so that's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so uh, we have Councillor Humphreys for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, it's been uh, a great discussion on the table, and, and I really appreciate um, the residents coming forward. Obviously, it's a very large concern and I keep um, remembering back when we wanted to place um, certain protective restrictions in the southeast district and it became a very contentious issue because some of the owners next door neighbors felt that they were being put restrictions on so on their property so it was very interesting uh, the two sides but um, absolutely think this is um, an important step in terms of keeping our uh, neighborhood stable and having like type uh, development and improvements. Um, my point was I'd like to have a more a public session to understand really what the, the residents really want so that we get it right. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of work done and this area wasn't, uh, you know, obviously a huge focus. So looking forward to that and we can add it to, I think, this actual 
motion in front of us later on after the discussion. Thank you, Councilor Humphreys. <laughs> Councilor Peary, Councilor Thompson. Councilor Peary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Councilor Gartner had stated that even if one home is built, if one monster home is built large, or one monster home is built next door uh, to a, a regular sized home, uh, that would be too much. Unfortunately, our bylaws, and even if we pass something here tonight uh, and move forward on, on this, would still allow for that to happen. Uh, I just want to be sure that everyone here is, is aware of that. And um, I disagree with Mayor Daw's point that we would be stopping six or seven homes from being built under this process. Uh, I think that the people building uh, would do a little bit more due diligence due diligence to ensure that what is built fits within our zoning bylaw and doesn't require a variance. So I, even in those circumstances, I can still see those six or seven homes getting built. Um, with regards to Councillor Marrakis's point, uh, again, I just want to make sure that everything around the council table is, is as accurate as possible. Uh, it's very much a possibility that someone can get a severance on a property without having to go through a committee of adjustment. Um, so depending on where the property is, how big the property is, you can get a severance in Aurora um, that meets the requirements of our zoning bylaw and you would not be required to go through uh, and get a, a minor variance on that. And the last thing I, I want to talk about, uh, we talk about how uh, this is affecting the older parts of town and and if we take a look at the map that's been provided to us that's not 100% accurate um, the interim control bylaw would not um, apply to, to Mosley Street uh, Church Street Well Street up until uh, Metcalf all of the oldest parts of Aurora this would not apply to Temperance Street it would not apply to that um, so this is for Homes, what we're talking about, again, clarity is important. Post-war homes is what we're talking about here tonight. Uh, and they were built smaller. They were built as bungalows. Um, and unfortunately, as things stand right now, nothing stops someone from tearing down one of those old bungalows and building something that that conforms to our zoning bylaw. Um, I, I, nothing we're talking about would, would stop or prohibit that from happening. Down the road, maybe we, we might shave off, uh, if you're building in a stable neighborhood, uh, we'll shave off a couple meters, but you can still build an eight meter house or a nine meter house uh, that, will, that will dwarf the bun bungalows beside it. And that's, that is what it is. Um, but I, I think, you know, we're trying to, to fix a problem that is real, that exists. Um, the development uh, com community will be upset. Uh, Build is, uh, you know, a group of developers who've gotten together to form an organization. Um, but with that said, what we're asking for isn't a huge impediment to anyone who's looking to build as well. I think doing this strikes a good balance between ensuring that our zoning bylaws are upheld. It strikes a good balance between giving somebody the right to build on their property, and that's not going to make everybody happy within within this room. But it is what it is, and so um, I think again I, I'm good to move forward on this tonight. I I don't disagree with Councillor Gardner that a, a public meeting would be of benefit, so I'll be in favor of that as well. Thank you, Councillor Peary. One note uh, I received from the clerk, uh, some clarification. He had um, let me know that it would actually be better procedurally from a minutes taking point of view to have the motion brought forward by Councillor Gardner in new business, even though it is substantive, uh, just for the uh, for clerical reasons in terms of taking minutes. So I will ask Councillor Gardner that you, that you make that motion uh, during new business. Uh, and I have Councillor Thompson for a second time. Thank you, Councillor Tom. Um, you know, I think we all recognize there's an issue and, and uh, you know, I agree with some of the comments that, uh, you know, the ideal process would to take a holistic approach and, and start top down and, and begin with our official plan. But unfortunately, as we saw in, uh, back in November when uh, Mr. Ramuno brought forward a report, 
I mean, it's delayed from the region, and, and based on the report, it talks about uh, the region's process is delayed till t uh, 2020, and ours is to follow after that. And so um, I think uh, it is good for us to try and find some interim solutions, or at least uh, try and address the issue as best we can while the OP is being uh, uh, developed or worked on at the region and, and here afterwards. And, you know, similar to other comments around the table, um, by itself, this is not uh, a blanket solution. This does not address the problem as a whole, uh, but it is a piece of the puzzle. And uh, it is something that's within our ability to, to put forward to at least um, address some aspects of the issue. Uh, it won't solve it completely, as we've heard around the table, but uh, I do believe, as others have said, it's a step in the right direction. Um, having said that, though, I still have an issue with Clause 3, and so I'd like to put forward an amendment that rather than uh, those, um, uh, that still allows for proposed minor exemptions, but rather than council making that determination, it's with staff. And so uh, I, I can't tell you that I have a perfect wording here, but it would be that staff be directed to allow proposed minor exemptions to areas affected by interim control bylaw at their discretion with the understanding that ultimately council would need to enact an amendment bylaw, an amending bylaw. Mr. Clerk, did you get that? Or I can provide it to him in writing afterwards, but. The intent of it is that, um, you know, that uh, staff be entrusted with making that initial decision about whether or not to allow that uh, minor variance to proceed. Proceed to the Committee of Adjustment? Uh, I believe so, yes. Is there a second? Sorry? Sorry, I'm sorry. Is there a seconder for that uh, amendment? Councillor Peary seconded it. Uh, speakers to the amendment? Uh, Councillor Maracas, Councillor Gardner. Or would you like to speak further, Councillor Thompson? Just simply, I mean, in the report it talks about uh, the way it stays now would follow similar to our zoning process. I think we're all familiar with uh, with the applications that we've had. We have another one on the docket this evening and stuff. And and I just, in those ones, there are much um, uh, bigger proposals, so I can understand the need to come before council. But in these cases, we're talking about relatively minor exemptions, and I think that uh, for efficiency and effective purposes, I think staff are capable of making that initial decision. Ultimately, as we've heard tonight, nothing will happen unless council uh, enacts a, a bylaw to exempt it from that area. So there's still a check and balance. So, thank you, Councillor Thompson. To the amendment, I have Councillor Maracas and Councillor Gartner. Councillor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I'm not opposed to to the amendment. I just want to make sure and make it clear that at the end of the day, council will have the final say if that if that minor variance would be allowed to be enacted and be removed from the interim control bylaw. So Through you to Mr. Ramuno. Mr. Ramuno. Through so you, Mr. Uh, Chair, um, with, with that change, uh, yes, if the variance application were to be considered by the Committee of Adjustment and approved, um, uh, they wouldn't be able to apply for a building permit until Council uh, uh, amend the impl the uh, interim control bylaw. Uh, if council doesn't, uh, um, that variance is still approved by the committee of adjustment. And when the interim control bylaw ceases after a year, um, hmm. that approval is uh, uh, would still be allowed. That variance uh, application has been approved. Would allow that applicant to proceed with uh, their building permit application. Just to be clear. Thank you, Mr. Ramuno. And through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Ramuno again. So, Mr. Ramuno, once this minor variance is approved, if, if approved by the Committee of Adjustment, if we go through the study, we make changes to the zoning bylaw uh, within stable neighborhoods, uh, we approve that, it gets approved, uh, there's no appeals to it, we're moving forward with a new zoning bylaw within stable neighborhoods would that minor variant still be allowed to go through? Mr. Amuno? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Chair. I mean, that's a, it's a good scenario. I'll have to give some, that some thought because a variance would be approved. That's something that we'd have to give some thought to. Um, and I could consider that and uh, report back to council uh, in a day or two prior to next week. Thank you. Um, for, for tonight's purposes, it's, it is GC. Uh, I. I, because I don't have that answer, I will be voting against this amendment. Um, but if, if 
if the answer comes back in a positive way where where I feel that we would still have that authority then then I'll I'll, I'll be in favor of the amendment at that time but uh, for now I'll be opposing that I mean but at the end of the day I don't think any of us are looking to to stop a, a restrict any of our residents that are looking to do you know maybe get a little minor variance for a garage uh, or, or you know for a little second story that fits within the neighborhood so that's why I am in favor but I want to make sure that we have that authority and that control still and I don't want something to slip through if we do make changes so uh, for tonight I will be opposing the amendment thank you Councilor Maracas I have Councilor Gardner for to the amendment Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For um, next week's meeting, I would like to see a list of the kind of things that Mr. Muno would think would uh, be appropriate that, uh, for staff to decide. And I'm thinking it's things like residents wanting to make uh, slight improvements to their neighborhood that would require a, a variance, maybe uh, roof overhangs or porch overhangs or things like that because uh, we certainly don't want or or addition to their homes that um, you know that would be in keeping with with uh, protecting the neighborhood as opposed to uh, I don't know how I can say this appropriately but, but things that would be in keeping more with protection than what exists now in uh, stable neighborhoods, things that would uh, perhaps cause residents uh, to be uh, very unhappy should come to council because it is council that really needs to be helping the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Councillor Abel to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the amendment, I, I, uh, it's, the, it's the minor variance, and if I am understanding, because it's getting very complex for me, um, the minor variance uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, we dealt with one, uh, Mr. Ramuno, uh, last term on Hunter's Glen, and I know this isn't in a stable, but just so I get an idea, where it was a two-acre lot, I think, and the person took down a modest 2,000-square-foot uh, home and then erected uh, a 10,000 square foot home and but it met the guidelines under 25 percent in that neighborhood and so someone came to me a neighbor said how is that minor and I said well under our guidelines that's a minor variance he's conforming to everything along so to put that back in perspective uh, would that be the sort of minor variance that we're talking about so what is the difference in a minor variance that I'm familiar with in the Committee of Adjustment and this minor variance that you're saying should go forward to the Committee of Adjustment. Mr. Amuno? Certainly, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we provided a sort of a, a, a couple examples at the bottom of page four where, where we think that there may be instances where minor variances would be appropriate, such as uh, where, where an applicant may be required to, uh, is looking to add a, a shed or a small accessory building that may need a reduction in the side yard or rear yard setback. A minor Thank reduction. Um, so those are the type of things that we were uh, uh, considering as being appropriate, and I could expand on that list for council next week. Um, Council Councillor Abel, uh, you're correct. In some of our uh, um, estate residential areas, we do have a, a, a provision in our zoning bylaw that requires minor variances for alterations in those areas. But those larger homes uh, still, you know, in a lot of those instances, uh, they still met the required zoning standards in the state residential uh, zoning bylaw. We just have a provision in our uh, zoning bylaw that requires the applicant to proceed by way of the variance, so we can essentially uh, evaluate that proposal as we do site plan applications and, and require a development agreement to be in place to ensure that uh, minimal disruption to those environmental areas. Um. Right. So I, I appreciate that uh, summary. It was uh, in a uh, sensitive uh, environmental area, and uh, but it was just the term minor variance that uh, caught my attention. Um, you know, and and I have uh, I, I appreciate that, but if this were to be go through the committee of adjustment and then it comes before council after the committee of adjustment, is that what we're saying? 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. So you know, and I'm I'm reminded of when we had three trees and and how this council um, s struggles. Well, takes a lot of time to uh, to to do things. Three trees, you know, a shed. It's all you know. That we can really work it around here. I've seen it done before. Um, uh, to me, it's just sort of a, another layer. But um, you know, I'm just going to go with the flow on this one. Thank you, Councillor Abel. Councillor Thompson for the second time. Thank you. Just, uh, you know, I don't want to complicate too many things, but, you know, I think Mr. Ramuno and his staff, uh, they understand, you know, they have enough political acumen to understand the will of council and, and the fact that, you know, we're really talking about really minor things. They're going to delegate. If it's a severance, then he, I think he understands, and he would, he would say no. But if it's a six-inch set, setback on a garden shed, that's not a good use of council's time to bring that forward. I think that they have the authority to, to be able to do it. It's no different than us delegating authority to them that they can spend up to $100,000. We trust their judgment, you know. So, again, uh, I just think that, uh, you know, I appreciate Mr. Ramuno coming back next week with a, with a greater list of examples to give everybody a comfort level. But I just think from an administrative per pers perspective, uh, this is uh, uh, a more effective route. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. I have Councillor Maracas for the first time. No, sorry, I have Councillor Peary, then Councillor Maracas to the amendment. Councillor Peary. Speaking to the amendment, I'm not sure everyone around the council table understands it. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that I understand it correctly, and hopefully while I explain it to myself, it helps someone else. Currently, the process that's being proposed, an applicant would submit a minor variance application. It would come to us. If we say yes, it'll go to uh, the Committee of Adjustment. If they say yes, it comes back to us to, for a final approval. Councillor Thompson's amendment is saying, let staff look at it first, and if they say yes, then it'll go to the Committee of Adjustment. If the Committee of Adjustment says yes, then it comes to us. So what it does is it prevents it coming to us twice. We only deal with the final approval of it and we don't approve somebody looking at it for it to come back to us. So I just wanna make sure everybody's on the same, uh, well, first and foremost, I wanna make sure I'm on the right uh, path and I wanna make sure everybody else is as well. So just for clarification to Mr. Amuno, that is my understanding is what's, what we're talking about, correct? Mr. Amuno, is that an accurate description? Uh, yes, it is, Mr. Chair, and uh, what I would be bring, bringing back to Council would be not to consider the merits of the variance application, but just to consider amending the interim control bylaw to remove a given property from the fr uh, defined area. Sounds great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peary. Councillor Maracas, for a second time, to the amendment. Or did you remove your name from the list? Oh, isn't that handy? Um, Anyone else with comments? Clause three uh, on R1 was an issue for myself, um, especially as it was written. The amendment is uh, interesting and the wheels are moving a bit. Um, but as Councillor, I forget who brought it up, but if the Committee of Adjustment hears a minor variance application and is it appro it's approved, um, and then council decides not to remove the property from the interim control bylaw, they would have to wait for enacting their approval, uh, approved minor variance until after the interim control bylaw had expired. And it would be interesting if there was any zoning changes, what, how that would be impacted. Um, I mean, the challenge I have is, you know, I would like, I would not like to hear every single minor variance application because that's why we have a committee of adjustment. They're delegated the authority to approve or not approve minor variance applications. Uh, it's set up arm's length from council for that purpose and is appealed separately to the OMB and it's really not a council, council process, right? Um, so I think the amendment, I think, makes it a bit more uh, appealing to myself in terms of passing. Um, but I think you know, because then, then, it, then it doesn't really limit people who want to put in, you know, an extra foot on their deck in the backyard. 
uh, which obviously the interim control bylaw really isn't, at least the intent of this is not to limit people putting who need a variance because they want to double the size of their deck in the backyard or the shed wants to be closer to the back fence or those types of things. So uh, I was not in favor of moving forward on item three, clause three, I should say, but um, to the amendment, uh, I think it makes it a bit more appealing because um, at least the Committee of Adjustment will be able to rule whether they think the variance is minor or not, and then Council can make its, its decision after that. So I'm in favor of the amendment. And seeing no more comments or questions, I'll call the vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries, Mr. Clerk. Back to the main motion as amended. I had Councillor Abel for the first time. Second time, sorry, Councillor Abel. I'm good, thank you. Um, so I, I, uh, um, I wanted to ask, the promenade area is not highlighted on this map through you, Mr. Chair, on the attachment that we have. I noticed that if you could draw in where the promenade was, is that a fair comment that the promenade could fit in within all those areas? And the reason none of them are included is because it has a secondary plan in place? Mr. Amuno? To you, Mr. Chair, no, the, so the three maps uh, identify the areas that would be uh, subject to the interim control by law, and as per the you know, uh, original motion, it really applies to the areas uh, that are zoned um, R3, residential R3, that contain sort of the predominant older housing stock and uh, single story existing housing stock. The promenade uh, area was left off because it has a, a, pro a promenade zoning. Okay. which permits uh, you know, mixed uses, a variety of different uses and heights, et cetera. So the three areas in, qu in question uh, really include the uh, R3 zone, uh, zoning areas throughout, uh, throughout town. Thank Council you, Rabel? and so they're outside of the promenade in every case because there are three. Thank you. And um, so, uh, I mean, there's, there's support for this going through and, and I'm, I'm the comment uh, I think that uh, I share, uh, I'm impressed that uh, this came around so quickly uh, from December 12th and Councillor Gardner you were saying that you had something along the stable neighborhoods back in October and we're still waiting for that but I think Mr. Ramuno explained that one is a different process and far lengthier but you know the, the, the fact that this came around very quickly is, is impressive and I thank staff for bringing that forward so quickly um, but I want to make sure I understand that if someone today were to demolish a home, as, as, as Mayor Daw had said, and leveled it, and then put up a bigger home, this, they could do that with, with this, um, if we put this in effect? Mr. Muno? Through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, that's correct. The way the interim control bylaw is worded, uh, <coughs> provided uh, uh, development is in keeping with the existing R3 zoning permissions, uh, you could build a uh, um, a larger home, much larger home. Yeah, on that property, notwithstanding you're affected by the interim control by law area. Because again, the R3 zone permits two-story dwellings up to 10 meter heights, 35% lot coverage, and a lot of those uh, older structures in some of these pockets, um, you know, are smaller bungalows that ha are single story and probably have coverages, you know, under 20%. So, th I mean, there's a couple in the Regency area, area that we are familiar with, and this is where all of this uh, spawned from. Those homes would be still allowed if this control, interim control bylaw was put in, in effect? Mr. Muno? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, y yes, again, there are a lot of new homes that have been built, and we've heard from members of the uh, public in the uh, in council. Uh, that do comply with the exist existing zoning. They just appear a lot larger. They are a lot, lot larger than the existing uh, uh, dwellings that are in the area that date back to the uh, uh, so late, early 60s. To be fair and clear, that this, what, what they were opposed to, what we, what we, and I understand what it is. I mean, if I had a home and someone erected something very big and over top of me, I mean, I wish it happened somewhere else to somewhere else. When it's near my neighborhood, I don't want that to happen. And you can see it evident, especially in the city. But we don't want to give the impression, if I could correctly say, that that won't happen if we, if we enact this, if we enact this bylaw. I think that has to be understood. That's what I'm understanding, Mr. Maruno, you're telling me that? They could still, that home, oversized, the way they are being built in, in these areas of, 
Glass Street, and I think one's on Child, will still go forward even though this is enacted. I think that's what Mr. Amuno is saying. Thank you. I just wanted to be clear. That the current zoning rights of owners will not be stopped with the interim control bylaw. So, okay, maybe it's a question I got to ask myself, but what good is this going to do then? I mean, if that's a concern. Thank you, Councillor Abel. I have Councillor Maracas for the second time. Uh, and I will explain. Uh, what good will this do is if anyone's looking to get a variance to our zoning, it will not be allowed. Sever a lot. Ask for a, a bigger lot coverage from 35% uh, from what's allowed right now. Ask for a higher in height. Ask for uh, more setbacks. It will stop that currently on 32 wells. That house would not be allowed under this interim control by law. They went for a minor variance to get, I think, I believe a 37 or 38 percent lot coverage. That would not be allowed. It would have stopped that for the time being while we conduct this study and look at how to better protect our stable neighborhoods. That's it. No one's saying that we're stopping all development. No one at this table has said that. What we're doing is looking at how we can get to a point that we can better protect those neighborhoods. Thank you, Councilor Maracas. Uh, any further comments from members of council or members of committee, sorry, on uh, this item as amended? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries, Mr. Clerk. That concludes item R1. So it took us a while, but we got through it. Um, I will allow if any members of the public wish to stay for the rest of our meeting. Obviously, everyone's <laughs> welcome to, but if members would like to leave, I, perhaps we could take our health break 15 minutes early. Is that... So we'll take, our, we'll take our break 15 minutes early, and I would encourage everyone to stay for the rest of the meeting, but certainly, uh, if not, uh, you're not obliged to. Thank you.
Okay. Members of council, back to our chairs. We can resume committee. I think there's, we have quorum. I think the other members were made aware that we're starting up. So we'll begin with item R2. I uh, may have a mover for item R2, the staff recommendation. I move by the mayor. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Peary. Comments or questions to item two? Councillor Peary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out that the, the blue and gold that's referenced as being part of the crest for the Queen's York Rangers isn't actually the crest for the Queen, Queen's York Rangers. It's the crest for the regimental council that has the blue and the gold on it. Um, I still think it works. Um, I think probably the, the golden or the the purple and green would have looked neat as well, but this works. I like the what we've got going on, so I'm happy to vote in favor. Thank you, Councillor Peary. Seeing no further comments, I'll call the vote. Councillor Abel, you have a comment? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, could I ask a question? You may. Oh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, on the um, page four. Financial implications. Um, outsourcing design services is not recommended in this case as the local designs require consistency uh, and staff expertise in these area extensive with staff having successfully worked on logo and branding projects. Uh, and it also says that uh, logos have been created in-house at no cost, but it, it lists no examples. So through you, Mr. Chair, could I have some examples of um, in-house uh, locals that have been created and um, just a background on some of the branding projects for the large governments and entertainment organizations. I'll go to Ms. Mackenzie Smith, but is that something you can answer at this time or would you require bringing that information back uh, for next week? Or can you answer now? Ms. Mackenzie Smith? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So we, um, in terms of uh, branding, so we do all of the um, logos and branding for all of our events that take place in the town, um, as well as we maintain all of the brand standards for um, the uh, municipality. So any um, internal branding as well as branding for something like Play Speak as an example, which we've launched, that's all done in-house. Um, and again, there's a secondary font, and that secondary font is um, utilized in this logo so that there is some consistency with, um, with the town brand per se. Um, in terms of staff expertise, um, I personally did uh, the rebranding of York Regional Police. Um, I've also done rebranding projects extensively as a consultant for private companies, including Saskatchewan Telecom, um, Nando's, um, as well as several uh, the launch of several pharmaceuticals uh, in Canada, including um, Viagra. Um, so <laughs> I have worked with some uh, fairly large organizations, including Pfizer, on, uh, on some branding projects. Um, for uh, their digital properties and um, our staff have also worked extensively on uh, uh, branding projects for um, Chorus Entertainment as well as Global Television. Councillor Abel. Thank you very much. Um, I was uh, just pointed out um, by someone that they went onto the Canva design and came up with the same logo in seven minutes. It's a free design corp so I was just wondering if that's what the staff had utilized in, in this that design, I mean, it's remarkably similar. But I'm just. Well, we have no terms. That we have no reference. I'll, I'll pass it around so. for uh, council and bring it forward uh, for for council next week. Thank you. Yep. Is that it, Councillor Abel? Uh, that'll be. Oh well, my comment is is uh, I thought we were going to uh, go external and get some public input on some other ideas for the logo, and of course, uh, what staff did in this case was just took the three logos and put them online for uh, consideration. So uh, there's no new ideas here, and uh, uh, I, I guess if it's more for the sign and not to uh, brand what we're doing there, uh, you know, I thought we would, uh, you know, for the, the logo designs and, and uh, ideas to distinguish what it is and to message what it is we have here is not being considered. Um, it's, only, it's only for a sign uh, to distinguish itself differently from what we're doing with Niagara College. So. Uh, a bit confusing, but um, I know this council wants to uh, get this forward, and uh, they all look, um, you know, 
I don't think it really matters to me which one is voted on, so I'll just go with the flow on this one. Thank you, Councillor Abel. I have Councillor Gardner, then Councillor Thompson. Thank you. I was wondering why the established in 1874 isn't also in gold, if there was a reason for that. Because it's, it's, it's pretty important. <laughs> it's a pretty important fact. Ms. Mackenzie Smith. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that it was, yeah, to make it pop a little bit more. Okay. Um, when you see the color version, it's unfortunately, oh yeah, you've got it there. Um, it's to make it pop a little bit more in the sign. Councilor Gardner. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, would you consider making it a little bigger? Anyway, that's just my comment. I don't so you, Mr. Chair, we certainly can do that. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Through you to Ms. Mackenzie Smith. Um, in the report, you, you know, just to Councillor Abel's point, you talked about the fact that uh, you know you have a lot of extensive experience in this, uh, in the process of developing the brands and, and so forth. And in the report, it speaks about the fact that we went out to the community, tried to gauge their input. And the difference between Logo A and Logo C was not significant. 41 people voted for Logo A and 49 voted for Logo C. Um, and I have my own personal uh, choice, but I'm interested to know what your and or staff's preference is, and I'd like to take that into consideration as well in conjunction with the community's response. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, our personal preference was, as uh, we originally put forward in the previous report, was for Logo A. Um, and the reason for that is because there are significant elements in it that distinguish the building and identify it more specifically to the actual um, physical elements of the building itself, which are really more consistent um, with kind of signage and branding because it makes it very clear when you're looking at that sign and you see the pitch of the roof and the the, um, the vertical um, boards that it's a sign for that particular building and it does create so that was our that was our preference it does create um, more of a sense of identity around that so from a branding perspective my personal preference is is for a however you know the majority of the people that that um, responded did vote for C Thank you, and, and I appreciate that because, to be honest, my preference is, is A as well. Um, and so I want to be respectful of the community, but at the same time, I want to leverage the expertise of our staff. And so, you know, sometimes when we go out for tenders in RFP, we use a scoring matrix system. And, and maybe in this case, you know, you, 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 you take into consideration the, the public's opinion and, and score that at 80% and staff 20% kind of thing, and it may change your perspective. But um, while all of the logos are good, I do agree that uh, having the roof pitch is an essential element of the logo, and my preference would have been for A. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my, my personal preference would have been for A as well. I, I, I like that design right from the beginning. Um, but I also did, separate from, from the town, I also did my own little uh, online I guess multiple choice and see what the residents uh, that, that follow me would, would choose. And um, I, I received probably about, uh, I'd say about close to 300, maybe slightly more responses. And I would say about 90 to 95% of them were for logo C, which is uh, turned out that. So I would, it was a very significant for that, for that logo. So, uh, you know, I'm torn too, is it, do, you know, do we go with what the public wants? And I think that's what we end up doing. Um, but. I, I, I do kind of have a preference for that, logo A. Thank you, Council Maracas. <coughs> Seeing no further comments, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Carries. Move to item R3. Someone want to move the staff recommendation? Is there a mover for item R3? Councilor Peary, is there a seconder for item R3? Are you seconding R3, Councilor Gardner? Pardon me? Yeah. Okay, seconded by Councilor Gardner. Councilor Gardner, would you like to? Uh, thinking we might poll the audience and see. 
Uh, okay, since we've moved and seconded R3, perhaps <laughs> after we <laughs> deal with R3, and then we're, perhaps we can pull the audience. Are there any speakers to item R3? Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, this is a uh, item three is a procedural bylaw. I think I have it here. Uh, so I, I asked uh, when this was last up, and um, forgive me, I'm just trying to look in the background. But I had asked the clerk for uh, on notice of motions uh, that how many um, other municipalities uh, require a seconder uh, before it's submitted to the clerk's office. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, it's um, it's more common that uh, that a seconder is not required, but um, there are certainly municipalities that um, P region of York, region of Durham, uh, city of Peterborough, uh, to name a few, are ones that do require a seconder. So, like I said, more common for just the single, but um, not you know there are municipalities that do require both. Councilor Abel. So single tiered, but not so much second tiered. So the examples you gave were single tiered. There are some upper-tier examples as well. York, Durham, our upper, yes. and a single tier would be Peterborough, so a larger municipality. Well, um, you know, I, I, I remember a couple things about procedure bylaws. One is that uh, it's owned by the council, and I remember in the good old days, Councillor Peary and I and Councillor Thompson went down to, uh, to learn about procedure bylaw when we were first elected last term. And uh, Mr. Fred Dean uh, said, uh, uh, you should do it, uh, it's yours, and you should do it at the beginning of the term. So I'm just wondering why we're doing it so late in the term. Mr. Clerk. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, when the procedure bylaw was done at the end of 2016, uh, staff committed to council a one-year review, and this is that one-year review. Or a year was about December of 2017. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a problem with this uh, change of notice of motion must be accompanied by a written confirmation of a seconder when submitted to the clerk's office. Uh, first of all, I, I, I don't know why we would do that. And I look for the rationale and it was suggested based on feedback. So I'm, 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 I'm going to suggest that councillors were the ones that gave the feedback. So a couple of councillors thought that this was a good idea. So I'm wondering if those councillors could come forward and, and explain to me why this would be a good thing if they would identify themselves. Continue well, perhaps, well, perhaps they'll, they'll comment after I make mine. Um, well, I, I do have a problem because I, 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 I sense that someone could, like myself, could come forward with an idea and then start looking for a seconder. And there's certain people here that will not second anything I do. And so it limits my ability to bring something forward. And then everyone could refuse. And then the same persons could then bring it forward themselves and get a seconder. So that is my main concern. And that would object, and that would be actually obstructing the process. Uh, unless there's a good reason why uh, I did ask Mr. CIO about it, and it was a rather candid conversation. He says it would save time, but I don't believe it does. Secondly, I would be, or anyone, would then be going around and taking more time, instead of just writing and putting it forward and bringing something forward for the public, I would now have to go and ask counselor after counselor after counselor. I would be, in effect, advancing business. Uh, when we did take... Um, uh, uh, advancing business, uh, one such criteria is to phone each person individually about the same matter. And that would be the same as going into uh, a private session with all of us, say at someone's home, and advancing business. And that is frowned upon. In fact, you're not supposed to be doing that. So that is another concern I have is about um, advancing town business. I could be calling everyone and saying, hey, listen, I got this notice of motion. Well, tell me about it. Well, it's about this, and these are the reasons, and this is it, and, and you, know, uh, you know, would you second it? Well, let me think about that, you know, and get back to you. So then I'd have to phone someone else, and on and on and on. So it's a time-consuming thing. And if you're not in favor with your colleagues, for whatever reasons, be it personal, be it agendas, or anything, 
and I mean, I'm not saying that that would be something that this council would do, but it could. Why not just leave it the way it is, which would make things transparent, fluent, and brought forward in a manner and avoid advancing business and avoid uh, people obstructing uh, for whatever reason. So those are sort of my comments why I'm not in favor of this. And I would, uh, I would like to hear from the, from the colleagues uh, that actually advanced this and, and suggested this to the CAO, that why this is a good idea. Um, I'm hoping they'll just speak to why it's a good idea. Thank you, Councillor Abel. Councillor Gardner. Um, thank you. Well, <clears throat> just to address Councillor Abel's um, question, um, I myself have been the odd man out on a council, and uh, it can be quite uncomfortable, and I wouldn't like to think that anybody at the table would refuse me um, to put forward a notice of motion, but um, it could happen, so I'm not in favor of this particular one. Um, I'd also like to, uh, I have some questions. My main concern is about notice, about motions being discussed at council. How can we, uh, as the democratic body, present something um, at a first meeting and not give public who are interested any opportunity to express their opinions. T to me, it just doesn't make sense unless we're going to ask people to come to the general committee meeting where there's a notice of motion on the agenda. Um, we could do that. But it would seem to me that it would be appropriate if people come to the council chamber to hear a discussion about a motion that one of us puts forward, that they have an opportunity <clears throat> excuse me, that they have an opportunity to speak. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Clerk, Mr. CAO, and members of council if we could figure out, if there's, if there's anybody who doesn't follow what I'm saying, Mr. Mayor, you're kind of looking at me in an interesting way. Um, but I think the point is, if we have people in the chamber to hear something that we're discussing for the first time and we're going to vote to put into action that we need to give the public an opportunity to express that. Um, okay, I'm gonna go through my list. I'll be as quick as I can. On uh, page nine, um, it says when we have to cancel a meeting, sometimes we have to cancel a meeting at the last minute uh, it happened last year because there was a, we closed down the town hall for too much snow. So I'm wondering, these things that are an, in number 20 on notice of meetings cancellation, can we also add that uh, residents be emailed it, or any interested parties that we have uh, emails of be emailed? I mean, we can't put a notice in the paper I guess we could have put it on the website, but, but we should take um, any avenue that we can to make sure that members of the public are notified. Maybe I'll be able to be clear on that next week. On uh, page 13, Um, could I just ask, under number 26, the last thing, administrative references, including bylaw, report, motion, and policy indexes not be included in minutes. Um, I think it would be helpful for residents if they're looking at minutes, they can see exactly what we're talking about uh, by including uh, a bylaw number, report number. Who, who am I addressing these questions? I think it's you, Mr. CAO. I Mr. think to clerk. the clerk would be appropriate. Mr. Clerk, could you give, I know that Samantha did an incredible job doing this. I know this was, was her baby before her actual baby. So uh, 
Maybe you can't answer that, or maybe you can. Mr. Clerk? Uh, absolutely, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, and we, you know, with the minutes, we'd certainly try and keep all relevant references uh, within. We just thought that this part of the bylaw um, didn't um, exactly apply because it's also mandated in the Municipal Act that the minutes will be kept without note or comment. Right. And so we're just trying to um, really just <clears throat> clean things up, to clean up the language and delete um, unnecessary sections is what we were thinking. Thank you. And I just think that anything that would help the, pol the public understand the minutes would be helpful. On page 15, number 29, the fourth line down, it says, any individual may address general committee to make informal inquiries or comment on matters of business. So <clears throat> in open forum, if a resident asks a question, and we had this tonight, do we answer their questions somehow? Um, Mr. Chair, you said that members of staff might get back to a resident to answer a question, but um, Mr. Clerk, is there a way that questions can be answered from the public? Could they, could they leave them in writing for staff members to call them? Are you talking about to, for delegations to GC or to open no forum? open forum? This is under open forum, Mr. Clerk. Um, we would encourage all um, anyone who comes to open forum, anyone in the public with a question, really, to um, send it to uh, one of us. Even if they don't send it to the right person, we can certainly forward it on. Make sure it gets to the right person, and make sure that they receive an answer. To their questions and I thought council did a good job tonight of writing down the questions and then answering them um, in our one so I you know I think the as it currently stands that that method it seems to be working thank you and pa council Perry was very good at answering the questions but I'm not sure that we ever actually do that in open forum so if that's fine with council that's great on um, page 16 very top do, uh, we're talking about pecuniary interests so um, and this does happen. Are we actually required in advance now to give written notification of conflict of interest? Mr. Uh, and and do you mean by email as well? Uh, as part of the Bill 68 changes, the, you are required to. Uh, we're, we're the clerk's office is required to keep a registry of all conflict of interest um, that has, have been stated by members of council. And um, so we do, um, is more of a, to make sure that we're getting the right interest um, required that the member submit something in writing. Now it doesn't need to be beforehand. It can be up to a week after. Um, we just oh, need great. something, uh, a declaration from the member that, that they did have an interest for a certain item and Thank what that you. interest was. Thank you very much. Um, is, that, is that actually in the bylaw for up to a week afterwards? Did I miss that? Thank you. Mr. Clerk. It, it isn't, um, that's, uh, we could certainly administratively add that in. Thank you. Um, on page 17, number 31, um, it's talking about community updates and having to give uh, a six weeks in advance notice. So does that mean if, if uh, really that means six weeks for any anybody including the region if they want to come forward they have to give us six, six weeks notice and and what if something comes up at a council meeting and we're asking for someone to come forward do we have to wait six weeks for that through you mr chair we're um you know we understand that some things are last minute and we would certainly we wouldn't um make the decision ourselves to uh um, keep something off the agenda like that we'd, we'd probably ask council to waive the procedure by law in, in such a case for these last minute things but we also find that we're having a little bit of trouble um, you know we, we, we might have a busy agenda with some controversial items we'll have three presentations that night and we can't get Great. to the items until eight o'clock and it's not fair to council or the public so we're just trying to set the expectations high thank you appreciate that uh, and also uh, in that section uh, at a limit number of times group or individual may appear um, what is that number of times? Have we decided it, it should be in? Mr. Clerk? Should it be in the bylaw itself? Uh, we didn't include a, a definitive number um, just for, for that reason and that we want to have some discretion, but you know, there are some groups that tend to appear um, far more than others, and I'm sure these other groups may like that opportunity. So are we supposed to be having discussion now about how many times we would limit a group? Okay, I'm going to finish my speaking time, but is, is that the intent that we're supposed to be discussing this? 
think I think the the feedback could be presented to staff now as the what's on the floor suggests incorporating council feedback so if you have a suggestion perhaps you should level that um, I don't know I would think once per quarter unless there was something pressing okay so um, I'm gonna leave that because I don't want to take my time on page 19 very top um, so delegations at general committee have to be uh, with on something within the jurisdiction of local government. I don't know what I'm doing to upset you, Mr. Mayor, but um, you're just looking at me in such an interesting fashion. Okay, so so does that mean if somebody wants to come to the podium and discuss mental health issues and say that um, there's not enough services? Well, that's a provincial issue. Are we allowed as a council to send down, I mean, we've done it before, send down a motion to or to our MPP? Are we allowed to do that? Because that's not within our jurisdiction, but I would think as we're trying to take care of our residents, that would be in our jurisdiction. Mr. Clerk? Mr. Clerk? Three, Mr. Chair, I don't think, I wouldn't have a problem with something like that coming forward as a notice of motion uh, from a, from a councillor. Um, you know, it, it gets difficult when we allow delegations uh, such as that to council about a, about an issue that we don't have any control over. So uh, certainly in a notice of motion, I, I think that's fine, but we are trying to limit delegations where council has no control over the, um, the policy that uh, the person has a problem with. Thank you. On page 20, it's my understanding that the Planning Act doesn't limit the, the length of time a resident can speak to us at the podium. Sorry, uh, Councilor Gardner, which uh, page are you on? Page 20. Page 20. With, uh, with at a planning, a statutory planning public meeting, that's correct. There's no um, limit. So, and so we are imposing a five minute limit on them? Because what happens is sometimes somebody will only need six minutes to finish the thought, so they don't get to finish their thought, and then they come back for a minute to add to it. I find that kind of, it, it it annoys me it must annoy the residents so can we have some do we need to can we take some liberty with that like five minutes sounds reasonable but we may have somebody who wants to speak a little bit longer so how how would we do that certainly um mr clerk i'll be uh i'll be attending my first town of our planning meeting tomorrow night so i don't oh, okay. i can't speak so you from can experience see, on okay. this one but um i do understand that uh, mayor dodd does allow um, you know, people to come down for a second time. And so uh, that is how I would propose addressing um, anyone who goes over the five minutes. Or okay, I object to that. I think they should be allowed to finish their thought instead of having to come back to, unless they're gonna tell us that they have a lot more to say then they can come back for a second time. I, I, I find that disrespectful to someone who comes to the podium to speak to us. Um, no, we've spoken about seconder. Okay, on page, uh, 23. No, I'll leave that one. Thank you. And uh, I think I'll leave the rest of them for now because people are getting bored. Th thank you, Councillor Gardner. I have Councillor Humphreys, Peary Daw. Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, no, Councillor Gartner, I wasn't getting bored. I, I appreciate your uh, your questions because th there were quite a few of them uh, were some of my concerns. The, the question that Councillor Abel asked and Gartner, in terms of uh, a second, I asked the exact same question, like, you know, you know, who, whether municipalities use it, uh, what's the greatest benefit, and I've th I've been thinking about it since, and um, I'm not sure I'm in favor of it as well. Um, I, I think I heard when I asked the question, well, that, that ensures that the motion gets on the table and there's no embarrassment when you're looking for a seconder and no one supports you and then it gets voted down. So that was one of the things I had heard. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's, I, I'm not really in favor of it. I, I think I'd like to see that one go away um, because I don't, want, I don't want good ideas and things to move forward because 
no one else wants to listen to it. Sometimes we start talking around the table and the idea gets better and, and things get added and you know we can move forward. So I'm not really into that one. Um, in terms of planning, I don't want to put any, I don't, you know, if we do the five minutes, that's fine. My dad does allow leniency and have people come back, but um, if, it bothers me that we tell them to go away and come back and then they have to start over again. I think we should just let them finish. I mean, we say five minutes, another minute, and then if they want to come back, they can. If they don't have to, that's fine. I just, I don't know. I just think that's. Um, and just relative to special, you know, so groups like, uh, can I get a little explanation about about like an example of that? Like the same people appearing, the same groups appearing many times. I mean, what are we trying to get? What are we trying to do there? <laughs> because sometimes you've got people like, for example, um, some Sport Aurora have so many different initiatives. Um, they're going to come because they need our help, they need advice. Like, what are we trying to do by limiting individuals or special groups? Can, you, can I get an explanation on that? <laughs> Just You're asking the clerk yes, for the clerk, clarification? Please. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's, it's purely a fairness thing. Um, if we had some of the groups, I don't want to get into specific names. Well, that's Council. fine. You don't have to. Okay. Just if we had some of the groups um, come as often as some of the other groups do, uh, we we could be here all night, and uh, you know we, it takes up um, some of council's time to deal with these um, important matters. I have to think about that one. I don't think so. For instance, if if a council meeting has two delegations, and the same group comes to every council meeting. To delegate at, at council, then that take then the, you only have oh, in effect you only have okay. one delegation available. So I think they're looking to limit the amount okay. of times you can delegate to council to perhaps give more fairness to other groups. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. I'll think about that one. Thank you. That's all for me. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. Councillor Peary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To, to some of the comments already made around the table, um, I think. It's unfair to say that somebody will, will not second a motion just because uh, of an individual who's bringing it forward. I don't think that's a fair statement. Uh, I know that I'd be happy to second any any motion that I personally agree with. And there are some that Councillor Abel brings forward that I don't agree with and some I do and I vote in favor and, and I don't vote in favor. Um, but that has nothing to do with, with um, any of the insinuations that Councillor Abel has brought forward. I also don't agree that it's advancing town business to, to give somebody a call um, or send out an email saying, is anybody interested in seconding this? If nobody's interested in seconding from an email, um, one, I, I don't think that it would get seconded at the table, but two, moving, moving that's not moving town business forward, that's just asking uh, if somebody will second a motion, and I think that's perfectly permissible. Um, so I actually did not bring that up to uh, staff, but I think it's a, a, a good idea. There are other municipalities that I'm aware of that will, prior to a meeting starting, uh, will put forward some sheets of paper with all of the, the regular um, items that are, are typically voted on, um, and councillors will, before the meeting, take a walk through, go see what's, what's on the table, and they'll sign their name next to um, each of the motions so that it's done, it's out of the way, um, and we don't have to sit around looking for people to, to second motions. Um, it's a different way of doing things. I don't think it's, it's a pro or a con, but I think it's, it's different. And I, from what I've heard some, from some individuals that I've spoken to, and I, I know that I've had conversations in the last two or three years with, with counselors who operate in this way. I can't remember who they are, um, but I'm sure if I, I go through my Rolodex, I'll be able to find them. Um, one thing um, that I, I found um, odd this evening, and I think that we need to, to address it, um, I think if somebody's going to come and delegate to council, there should be an expectation that they speak um, to council. Um, I, I have no issue with showing a, a video that's one or two minutes long that, that shows something. But I think there should be an expectation that anyone coming to delegate to council is able to speak to council. For the same reason that we're not allowed um, to call in and, and be on a teleconference 
during council meetings. I think I think it's um, disrespectful um, to the process um, to to operate in that way. So one thing I, I would specifically like to see is is an expectation that there's going to be speaking. Um, I think that's that's fair. If there's a presentation where somebody wants to show a video, like we've seen with the Queens York Rangers, um, that that video that uh, the Sesquicentennial Committee had had put together, I think that's that's fantastic and and worth looking at. But generally speaking, I think um, that's something that that really needs to be put into our our procedural bylaw. Do I need a motion for that? Or is that something that, that staff will take under advisement? I can certainly take it under advisement. Clerk's advising you can take it under advisement. I appreciate him advising that I'll take it under <laughs> advisement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peary. Mayor Daw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm afraid I didn't follow all of Councillor Gartner's concerns with respect to speaking limits, especially with, re with respect to the time. Uh, but I can tell you that anybody who signs up to speak as a delegate has to check off a box that says, I understand I have five minutes. So it's, it's not something that, that just happens at the last minute. And um, so I, I think that that should be noted and we all have speaking time limits here. Um, that's, I mean, quite frankly, one of this, it's challenged, no question it's a challenge, but it does help you uh, crystallize your thoughts. Uh, and if you wanna come and speak in public like that, I always suggest that people practice just so they have a, a better sense of what's going on. Um, not, notwithstanding uh, Councillor Peary, uh, Councillor Peary's comment on the motions, I don't have a problem if a motion comes to Council. It doesn't have a second. It does happen at the region, and it does sp speed things along. But if it, I mean, I, I've got no issue with that coming here. I do think, to uh, Councillor Peary's point, I totally agree with him. We need to tighten up our delegation criteria, uh, and um, I think we need to find a much better way to do that. So, I'll just leave that at this point in the hands of the clerk. Thank you, Mayor Dow. Uh, any more speakers to this item? Councillor Thompson. Um, I guess just for the clerk to take under advisement, you know, a procedural bylaw speaks a lot about, um, you know, how we conduct business uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, and there's a lot of language about uh, how to conduct ourselves appropriately uh, during the course of the meeting. but. Um, I find that there's a discrepancy between what is being asked of us and how we conduct ourselves and, and what is being asked of uh, the public. And I think that there should be uh, a, a commonality there, that the expectation is that the same language that's in the procedural bylaw with regards to how we conduct ourselves with one another is the same language for anybody that comes to the council meeting, you know, um, who delegates, who comes to open forum. Uh, I think that the expectation is that we all act in, in the same respectful uh, and professional manner. And I'd like to see the language be similar within the procedural bylaw um, for all people who are involved in, in the, the council meeting. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Anyone else uh, wishing to speak for the first time? Councillor Maracas, I'll go to you first and then I'll go to Councillor Abel for the second. Councillor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I actually wanted to speak to our, our speaking times. I, I was against uh, making the change when it came to council meetings and going to five and five. Uh, and for the, for the mere fact that it's the first time we're speaking to a notice of motion that we've put on the floor. And I think five minutes is not enough time for the first time that you're speaking to your motion and to get your point across to your colleagues and to the public. Uh, I, I wasn't in favor of making that change. I, I believe that it should go and be similar to GC and revert back to 10 minutes and then five, uh, just for that reason. Thank you, Councillor Maracas. Anyone else wishing to speak for the first time? Councillor Abel, for the second time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to put a motion on that we delete the um, part and um, notice a motion requiring a seconder before it's sent to the clerk. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, 
uh, the clerk has advised me that he, uh, through the discussions of this evening that he would has taken it under advisement that it doesn't have enough support to move forward through the bylaw and therefore he wouldn't be recommending when the bylaw comes back that a seconder be required for notices of motion that's good enough for so me. i think that's what his advice to me just now is so i don't think it requires a m separate motion uh we're looking to give if you take it up that's fine that's good I'm not sure what he just mentioned that so I, I think you have to be specific council Gardner so that we can so, oh I'm getting you mixed up gosh uh, I'll get it I'll get it right soon uh, Councillor Humphreys I think we just have to be specific about Councillor Gartner's <laughs> request so Councillor Gartner for the second time thank you um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to uh, know if there's any will on council to provide an opportunity for people who are coming to listen to uh, a motion at a council meeting if there is any will on council to try and find a way to ensure that the public can speak to that motion as that will have been the first time that it is actually on a council agenda. It seems to me to be part of the democratic process that if it's the first time council will speak to it and decide that the public should be able to give us their input. I think the current process is that there's two delegations allowed at council and that those delegations can be related to any item on the agenda, which would include motions put forward. So are you suggesting, Councillor Gardner, that you would like an, an additional maybe delegate? even Maybe even an open forum or something at, at Council. And not everybody knows how to delegate. It, it, it's kind of, OK, I mean, uh, some people seem to understand it, and some people are OK with it the way it is. But um, I think it's disrespectful to not give them an opportunity to speak outside of the delegation process. So that's that. Um, okay, I would also like to uh, say something about page 21 and 23. Um, I have a, uh, as the clerk knows, I uh, had um, a, a problem putting something on the agenda, and I, I understand that. Um, but I'm wondering, when we receive uh, an email in general from a member of the public, are we allowed to put it on an agenda as a C item? I'm looking at number 33 on page 21. It says communications addressed to council. Does that mean email communications from residents as well? Mr. Clerk? Oh, yes, of course, we'd have to black out their names if they requested. Absolutely, um, and they would and they'd be subject to um, certainly content uh, st or, um, stipulations and things like that. You know, there, it does not say that it doesn't apply to email, so I, I would say that, yes, um, it, it does. I would, I would also point out, though, that um, in, at least in my time here, that's very, uh, we, I don't think we've included an email on, um, on the council agenda. Now, it, it does vary over um, by municipalities, but at least the, the practice of the town of Aurora has been not to include emails, especially since um, I think you know, generally they're sent to all of mayor, mayor, or mayor and council, so that would be uh, what I would uh, say to that council gardner um well i'm gonna pull rank here and say that we have allowed that uh so yes uh we we definitely have allowed that um so uh it's something i may try to do in in the future if i think it's appropriate Okay, I think that's all for now. 
Thank you, Councilor Gardner. Is there any more feedback from Council regarding this item? Um, I think my only comment would be with respect to a delegation to a general committee meeting. The current procedural bylaw discusses that for Council, the de delegation must be uh, regarding an item on the agenda, but that a GC uh, uh, delegation must only be a town issue. I think you mentioned it earlier, Councilor Gardner. My personal preference, again, this is just my opinion, is that for a GC agenda, or GC delegation should be subject to the same stipulation as councils, and that is that it should be related to an item on the agenda. We forget, I think, that we are the elected members. The, the, the public elects us to be voices in this democratic body, and while we also would engage our community through delegations to committee and to council, we also are representatives of the public. And so I think that if um, you know, a certain issue was w wanted to be discussed by members of the public, a motion could be put forward by a council member to include, have that included on the agenda. And the second thing I would say, again, that's just a comment, the second thing I would say, and more of a question to the clerk, although council does not discuss a notice of motion, is it, form, is it technically part of the agenda? The yeah, what's the, I mean, the, uh, currently, even if we made that change that I just described, it is on the agenda. So someone from the public could delegate to a notice of motion, right, because it's on the agenda. And if we didn't make that change, it is, it is germane because it's uh, town business. So although at the council meeting, they wouldn't be able to delegate potentially if there was already two delegates, at, co at committee, they could they could still delegate to a notice of motion because it is on the agenda and it is town business. So nothing would stop a member of the public currently from coming to delegate to a, a motion that's not being discussed by council, but certainly would be able to make their voice heard under the current bylaws, unless I'm incorrect. So, I mean, Councilor Gardner, you, you've already spoken twice, but so I, I, that's just a comment. I mean, my comment is that. I think currently, if someone wants to speak to a notice of motion, they can. Just councillors can't talk about it at a committee meeting. So um, that's really the only restriction. Uh, and that probably stems out of the fact that you can't make a motion at a, a GC. You make recommendations to council to enact a uh, motion. So procedurally, I think it'd be difficult to discuss as councillors a notice of motion at a, at a committee meeting because it's council that enacts motions, not, not committee. So anyhow, those are just my comments on those two things. Like I said, I think tightening up the GC delegation uh, aspect of our procedural bylaw, I'd be fine with that. And, uh, and also uh, certainly uh, that, wouldn't even, that change wouldn't even stop a member of the public from delegating to a, a notice of motion that would be discussed the next week at council. At least that's my opinion. And seeing no other comments from members of council, uh, I'll call the vote on this item. All those in favor? Opposed? Councilor Gardner's already spoken twice. No, nope. You can do that next week. I, I would be happy to... to no, I'm, we'll do, I'll do it next week. Okay, so again, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. We'll move on. I guess, actually, I've been requested by Councilor Gardner, um, and I finally got her name right, um, to... Um, to poll the audience, does anyone in the audience have an item that uh, is of importance to them that council or committee might move forward to be discussed at this point? Or are we, pardon me, R8? R8 and R7? Four, seven, and eight? Well, four is being discussed next, so. I think uh, perhaps we could get a motion to move items seven and eight after R4. Do I have a mo mover for that? Mover by Councillor Humphrey, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. So we'll move to R4 next, and then move to R7, R8, and then we'll continue with the agenda. So item R4, do I have a mover and a seconder? The staff recommendations. Moved by Council or by Mayor Daw, seconded by Councillor Peary. Comments or questions to this item? Councillor Peary, Councillor Gartner. Council Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to Mr. Ramuno, um, I'm just pulling it up, but uh, I remember that the, the schematics had some logos of different um, companies. Do we know if those are uh, for sure? Never mind, I'm looking at the wrong application. Never mind. 
Pardon me. Okay, thank you, Councillor Peary. Councillor Gardner, two in a row. Uh, through you to Mr. Muno. Is there um, any requirement for um, this property to meet accessibility standards? Because there's stairs at the front, stairs at the back. There would be no way for someone to get in. Mr. Muno. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, there is no change to the existing building. Um, so they won't be applying for a, I don't think so at this point, a, uh, for a building permit but it is something that we can certainly take a look at as part of the uh, site plan application as to whether it's actually gone to the, uh, uh, yeah, it hasn't gone to the Accessibility Review Committee again because uh, there is no change to the, uh, to the building itself. Uh, the primary changes are really just recognizing the, uh, the change of use to office use and uh, establishing the uh, parking area. But it's something that we can certainly have a discussion with, with the applicant about. I thank you, and there may not be any requirement, but um, there, there also may be. Um, on the chart on page five, talking about parking spaces, um, I can't relate it. So two parking spaces is what the zoning bylaw says, and what is, how does that relate to 6.7 parking spaces per 100 meters squared? Mr. Muno? To you, Mr. Uh, Chair, the actual, um, yeah, under the, uh, the existing zone requirement, a minimum of two spaces is required. Uh, we are applying a, uh, a, a greater rate because they do have space, and the six spaces uh, does work out to, it is just under 100 square meters in floor area. So if you times that by the 6.7, they would need approximately six spaces, and that's what they are providing for. And that's why we've identified that rate of 6.7 because they do have the space to provide for the uh, six spaces. Councilor Gardner. Thank you. I noticed one of these spaces is for uh, staff slash, I mean, and they, this is a required space, slash staff snow storage. So that means it becomes one less space in the winter. And does that still make them in compliance? To you, Mr. Uh, Chair, yes, again, because they are exceeding that minimum requirement of two spaces within, the, uh, within our current parking supply of the promenade. So they are exceeding that. The minimum is two, uh, but we've identi they've identified six, notwithstanding one is, uh, is, is a temporary space or w won't be used during the, uh, during the winter months. Councilor Gardner. Thank you. I am not comfortable with that as it's a business and they may be having more than between staff and clients. Um, there is no, the, the southern boundary is, uh, is asking for a variance. So basically to have no buffer area, just a fence. So this is being used now for commercial, but it could also be used for residential. I think the zoning allows it to be used for residential. So if it was, uh, I mean, we do like to put a buffer between residential areas. Could somebody come back to us with, uh, if they wanted to turn it into residential or maybe a bed and breakfast or something like that, where, where a buffer would be uh, good to have? Could they come back to us? Mr. Um, to you, Mr. Uh, Chair, again, it's an existing situation where there is no buffer, and so they are seeking relief because, again, there is no uh, a space for a buffer, and the, the uses that are permitted are, are, uh, are the commercial uses, but they can also use the property for a, uh, um, uh, a single detached uh, residence or a, a bed and breakfast, and a buffer isn't required. In, in that instance. So again, it is just recognizing an existing situation with the, uh, uh, the driveway aisle on that southern property line. Thank you. Could, are we also able to ask for permeable, permeable pavement? Is that within our purview as a council? Marco? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, it is, because we are dealing with a site plan application. Thank you. 
We seem to be getting more concerned about the environment with things like the community energy plan. And just I just don't understand. It says the rear yard on page five. It says it's 7.5 meters, but on the next page it says it's 7.0 meters with an asterisk. Could you just? I'm looking at page five and page six of the report. So now the question just asked is on page six. Yeah, page five says 7.5 meters, and page six says 7.0 meters. Oh, I'm sorry, we're asking for, I'm sorry, we're asking for an exception there. That's right. But there's still going to be plenty of buffering because we do have a residential property next to it, although it's very long yard. Y yes, that's correct. And there, there, uh, towards the uh, eastern property line, I mean, there, there's a fence, but there's also some uh, planting within that uh, area uh, towards the eastern property line. Thank you. And I'm oh, sorry, last question. It looks like it's a one-way drive. Is it a one-way driveway? Uh, it is. Yes, it is essentially a one-way drive. Yeah, it's just it's around uh, three and a half meters <coughs> at, at its narrowest, which is a one-way drive. So because it's not a public use building, we can, I mean, I've actually never seen a one-way no. driveway. Yeah, there, there may, there, there'll be signage required as well with, with respect to just identifying it as a, a one-way one drive or just for drivers who are exiting uh, uh, to be aware that there could be oncoming traffic coming. Uh, Mr. Muno, have we, uh, you, Mr. Chair, have we ever allowed that before? Mr. No? Muno? Okay. Uh, y yes, yes, there are many situations, uh, especially within the, uh, the shoulder area where we have a lot of our heritage properties which have been converted to office uses where they have parking uh, lots in, in the rear and the drive aisle is really uh, just a one-way uh, space. Thank you. I'll check my memory. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> through you, uh, um, I'm just doing the comparison that they're asking for a zoning exception zone be approved. Can you, can you, sp like, I'm having a problem seeing what it is they're asking for, where, especially when I'm looking at permitted uses, because as I see quickly, they're identical. So, what is the exception? And if you could just sort of highlight it, give me the short Coles notes. I think the exceptions are indicated by an asterisk, but Mr. Oh, Romano, thank you. can you confirm? Are there any asterisks? Through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, yes, the, the, uh, the exceptions to the zoning standards are identified by the asterisk. So there are a number of them, the front yard reduction in front yard, um, uh, driveway width as well, and the, uh, and, the, and the parking. But we are identifying a, a greater parking uh, uh, number and the uh, reduction in the uh, landscape strips. Councilor Abel? So it's as much to do about the uniqueness of the land and modifying it for the use that they require. Through you, uh, that's correct, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and this is a little unique in that uh, the application uh, was submitted uh, prior to the finalization of our zoning bylaw. So we did capture some of our, uh, added some additional uses within the promenade zone, zone categories. So for all intents and purposes, it is really to recognize uh, some of the uh, uh, reductions in zoning uh, standards. Thank you. Permitted uses were added as part of our comprehensive zoning update to our promenade and, uh, area. Through you, Mr. Chair, we have done several of these conversions on the shoulder areas along Wellington. We've, we've converted the zoning to mix, use commercial, business, and this follows right along what we've been allotting as we go along. Uh, usually we see an enhancement in the uh, the building itself um, and they conform to our heritage aspect and they they bring business so usually at a professional level so I'm, I'm as I understand it I'm all in favor of moving forward and improving thank you thank you Councillor Abel seeing no more comments to this item I'll call a vote for R4 or sorry yes R4 all those in favor oppose that carries Mr. Clerk We'll move now to item R7 and then to R8. So is there a mover and a seconder for the, um, I guess, or do we have to provide direction? No, the, is there a mover and a seconder for the staff recommendation? I, 
have a mover for the staff recommendation and a seconder. Comments to this item? Uh, moved by Councillor or Mayor Daw, seconded by Councillor Peary. Comments to the item that's on the floor? Councillor Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not entirely sure what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say. Am I allowed to give my reasons why I won't accept this? I think you could cover it in your own actions accordingly. Okay. Um, well, and and if um, this passes, I'll address it at length next week. But um, this is this uh, area that's being proposed to be redeveloped is affordable rentable rental housing. We don't have a lot of affordable rental housing in Aurora, and. Um, we're mandated, the, the province mandates us, the region mandates us to increase uh, the rental housing stock, and uh, especially at the affordable level, not subsidized, affordable. So, um, and this, this report says that the stacked townhouses would be affordable. Um, and that may be in relation to other stacked townhouses, I don't know, but it certainly won't be affordable into relation to what already exists here. So uh, I, can't, uh, I can't agree with the staff report on the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Councillor Peary? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to, for clarity, we're not talking about demolishing those apartment buildings, we're just talking about adding the stacked townhomes, correct? Pardon me? We're not talking about demolishing what's currently on site. We're talking to adding additional stacked townhomes, which are going to be rental stock as well, I believe. I think what we're talking about is whether or not we're going to accept this application. I just want to make sure everybody understands what the application is. Because Thank you. I'm, I, it's my understanding that we're not talking about tearing these down. We're talking about adding to it. I mean, would you like to go to staff for uh, I, clarification? That's, I, that's where I asked, yeah. Mr. Ramuno, could you clarify Councillor Peary's remarks? Certainly, yes. Yeah, so you are, Mr. Chair, that, that's correct. The proposal is to amend the apartment zone to permit uh, the addition of three blocks of, uh, of a total of 64 rent, uh, stock townhouse units in addition to the uh, existing uh, two seven-story uh, apartment buildings that are there. So they're just making use of uh, the additional space that's on site. Councillor Perry. I have no issue with building additional um, to help service the site and, and to help more people get into that site. I have, I have no issue and I also believe it's going to be uh, affordable. So I'm in favor of this. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Councillor Gardner, I have you wishing to speak for a second time. I'll go to Councillor Thompson first and then uh, you're first up for the second round uh, of speakers. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you. Um, just I want to get a, a point of clarification from Mr. Ramuno with regards to the passage of Bill 139. It's my understanding now that Bill 139 has passed that any applications that come before us today will now fall under the jurisdiction of the new rules as outlined by the province with the local planning appeal body. Is that correct? Mr. Ramuno? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. And so, uh, you know, previously I, I've spoken against accepting uh, these kind of zoning amendment applications because of my concern of it falling under the old rules of the OMB. Um, you know, with the passage of the Bill 130, municipalities have gotten what they've asked for. They said, let us decide how we're going to build our communities. Uh, some people in the development community pushed back and said, well, municipalities, careful what you ask for, or they would concern that we wouldn't exercise our rights. And so, you know, uh, I'm okay now going forward with accepting these zoning applications because uh, the way the legislation is written today, we are the deciding authority. And so um, I'm not going to speak to the merits of it, but the process itself I'm more comfortable with because I know at the end of the day our decision holds weight. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Anyone wishing to speak for the first time? I'll move. Oh, Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, I'm not... Uh, in terms of the merits of the plan, um, you know, I'm not personally a big fan of stacked townhouses, but I think uh, uh, it acts as a, as a you know, great buffer between 
a higher rise rental uh, buildings or two of them uh, and the uh, you know the single detached low rises that are surrounding it so I think it acts as a great buffer um, for, uh, so as from aesthetic and uh, a practical perspective and the fact that it is uh, rental units uh, I'm all for it Thank you Councillor Kim Councillor Gardner for the second time Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I think I have read this incorrectly through you to Mr. Muno. So Mr. Muno, the, there's green space on the corner of Murray and Wellington currently. To you, to yep. you Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I mean, where they're putting those three blocks, uh, one is on the southeast corner of Wellington and Murray Drive. I think that's where their current pool is. And the other two blocks will be along the uh, eastern edge, just east of the uh, southern apartment building. And, and what did you say with uh, Murray and Wellington? What did you say is there now? I believe they have the, uh, um, a pool in that location. A pool for the use of the apartment buildings. And uh, along the eastern, southeastern boundary, what, what is there now? Through you, Mr. Chair, R right now it's just a uh, some parking and the majority of it is just a grassed area okay thank you I'll, I'm going to have a look at it in the in the next week so in other words it's taking away amenity space to put up residential Mr. Mr. Chair, yeah, a combination of uh, some of the many space and, and some parking, and if we deal with the application, we'll, we'll uh, have to uh, ensure that there's uh, sufficient parking on site uh, to accommodate the existing and proposed uh, number of units. Thank you, and would this be considered high enough density for infill development? This would be called an infill development? Do you, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. And it's high, and it's it's close to a transportation corridor. Is this high enough de density for this? Uh, again, it is. Uh, the, uh, the official plan designation in this instance is stable neighborhood. Townhomes are permitted. The zoning is uh, specific to those two apartment buildings. So the zoning would have to uh, be amended to identify uh, the permitted use of uh, stacked townhouses. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gardner. Any comments, further comments from Council? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Move to item R8. Um, would uh, someone like to put that on the floor? Moved by Councilor Kim. Is there a seconder? Seconder for item R8. Seconded by Councilor Maracas. Comments to item R8? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. Oh, Councilor Kim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I know uh, one of our uh, prominent residents had uh, concern about uh, invasive species, and uh, a couple of uh, a couple of them that he had mentioned uh, to me was about Japanese knotweed and Tartarian honeysuckle. Which sounds good to eat. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, so as, as we know, these uh, invasive species, you know, they're pretty pervasive and hard to get rid of. And, uh, and the fear is that uh, when construction begins, some of the, uh, the rhizomes will go downstream or, or uh, to other parts of uh, Aurora or York region and, and can spread. Is, is there any plan to, uh, through, you know, the generally accepted uh, invasive species termination practices uh, to get rid of them before uh, the project uh, proceeds uh, through you Mr. Chair to uh, Mr. Downey or Mr. Uh, Ramuno who would be best equipped to take the councillor's question Mr. Ramuno certainly through you Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, as part of this uh, project that the region is going to undertake in partnership with the uh, um, Conservation Authority, I mean, they'll have to do the detailed uh, uh, design for the retrofit, and it's something that we can certainly speak to them about. Uh, and, and Mr. Downey mentioned that we could uh, we can deal with the evasive species by uh, uh, by spraying it with the appropriate uh, um, 
called Roundup. Easy. That's right. So it's something we can, our uh, operation staff can deal with. Councilor Kim? Thank you. Are you talking uh, Roundup, like uh, the stuff that uh, sold in Walmart, or is this something more powerful? Uh, Mr. Downey? Uh, uh, Roundup is a chemical that kills everything green. It's a systemic herbicide. So once it touches leaves, it, go, it kills everything down to the root uh, and is not residual in the soil. So it's a, it's a great chemical for killing um, invasive species or anything that uh, you want to clear out prior to um, uh, doing any work in the area. So that can happen um, because we will be then disturbing the soil um, and we want to make sure that um, we leave as little of that behind as possible. That's why I like a systemic herbicide. Okay. Uh, thank you. And one last question uh, through th uh, th Mr. Chair to Mr. Downey. If, uh, if the town or st staff feel that uh, a different uh, process uh, might, might be uh, best to rid uh, the area of the uh, Basis species, uh, would York Region be open to uh, those suggestions? Mr. Downey? Or, or, or are they just uh, stuck on uh, Roundup? No, I, I, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we're not stuck on anything in particular. It's just it's one of those things, one of those, uh, one of the methods in which to remove the material. Um, you can also blanket it, um, and smother it. Um, so there, there are a number of methods that we could use that uh, perhaps the region has used in other areas that they find is more effective. So um, I haven't got any particular uh, method in, in mind. I just I happen to mention there's one uh, as far as the systemic herbicide goes. Um, it will be a conversation that we'll be having uh, between the region and ourselves. Uh, we have those talks going ongoing as it is right now because there is some um, play equipment in the area as well, and we're trying to coordinate that with the uh, with the with the new play yeah. equipment going in the area. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kim. Councillor Gartner. Thank you. Through to Mr. Johnny. Mr. Johnny, what exact, exactly does it mean um, that um, a reclamation system? Are they talking about sewage? I'm sorry. I'm on page uh, two at the bottom. Will enable the region to implement the water reclamation center to accommodate growth. So, uh, Mr. Yes, Mr. Mr. Minow, sorry, sorry, Mr. Downey. To you, Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Councilor Gardner. So this is part of the region's uh, program with the Conservation Authority to reduce phos uh, phosphorus levels uh, as part of the right. uh, watershed. Um, right. and, and the goal is to, uh, as part of the Upper York uh, Reclamation Center. So the up Upper York Sewage System Reclamation Center is the uh, project that region um, um, has identified as part of their uh, master uh, capital plan uh, to deal with additional uh, uh, um, sewage treatment up in East Gwillimbury. So as part of that environmental assessment process, they are looking at other ways to reduce phosphorus levels and they are, have embarked up upon a, uh, a program to retrofit at their cost um, um, storm ponds within the three municipalities or Newmarket and East Gwillimbury. So I mean it's a good, it's a, it's a good thing all around. Uh, they'll retrofit the pond, reduce phosphorus levels, uh, meet those targets within the uh, uh, within the watershed. Thank you. I, I agree. It's fantastic, and we're not paying for it directly. I'm I'm just trying to figure out. I, I can figure out what a Holland Landing sewage lagoon is, but I can't figure out what um, the reclamation. Hold on, I lost my place. To implement the water reclamation center, like what does that mean exactly? Is that a sewage treatment facility? That's exactly what it is. The uh, Holland, La Holland Landing Lagoons currently exist, but the Upper York system is what they're referring to as the uh, Water Reclamation Center. It's a sewage treatment plant, essentially. Thank, thank you. I know we've been having trouble. The, the mayor also indicated he might have a comment. Getting that, that in place. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Maroon is correct. There. First of all, there's um, in East Quillenberry, there's still sewage lagoons uh, to the to the shock, yeah, to the shock of many people. Um, and that's being held up 
uh, because the Water Reclamation Center, which is perhaps a fancy name for a sewage treatment plant, um, but it's a very, uh, very high-tech facility, um, uh, has been hung up at the provincial government for over three years in terms of getting approval to move forward. Uh, so there, this is a, an extremely long, detailed process that has gone through, but the, the overall goal is to increase the quality of the water going into Lake Simcoe, first of all, by do, giving it much better treatment uh, and reducing the phosphorus at the same time. So this is part and parcel of that. I hope that helps. Thank you, Mayor Dahl. Councilor Gardner. Thank you very much for good explanation. Uh, so I, th this is in the middle of a park. It says Tamarack Green Park. Uh, I don't know. Oh, I guess Mr. Downey could answer this one. Could you repeat your question, please, Councilor Gardner? Through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Downey. This is taking place in Tamarack Green Park. Is this actually a park that the residents are using? And if so, how are we going to, uh, you know, block off this land? Mr. Downey? A and do we have to notify the residents as there's many homes around it? To you, Mr. Chair, um, with regards to the work that's being performed on the stormwater management facility, there's already a stormwater management facility in the, in the park. Um, <clears throat> So they are going to be working in that particular area and we are coordinating that work with the region. Um, we also have approval for playground upgrades in the area as well. So we're coordinating that with the work with the region. So um, uh, we are, uh, we, this is, we're at the uh, beginning of this process. Uh, we have ongoing conversations. The region will be responsible for the overall construction of that. Uh, uh, public notification will be their responsibility. Um, uh, however, when we move forward with the playground installation, it will become the responsibility of the municipality, and uh, we generally do a community um, meeting just to, to determine what uh, uh, elements people would like to see within the park. Thank you very much. That's a, a fulsome answer. Any idea how long this is going to take? Um, we haven't got a deadline right now, um, and um, uh, the region hasn't committed to a time frame, uh, so I, I, I can't. Um, okay. uh, it, as you can appreciate, we are, will not be in control of the project, so sometimes these go on a little bit longer than people anticipate. Um, uh, we know, though, that we will not move forward with our playground uh, modifications until the region has completed their work. So I'm sorry, but I haven't gotten, the, the region's not committing to a deadline. As you can appreciate, that's a little bit, I know that's a little bit frustrating, but um, uh, it is a regional project. Thank you. And, and the residents will be able to use the park while this is going on? Um, that will all depend on the extent of the, the work. And we're, as they say, that's part of the conversations. They haven't given us a, a committed area at this point, a construction area, and whether or not that is going to have a, uh, a negative impact on the park, that will be a part of that conversation. Um, I'm happy to inform council uh, once I have a little bit more information about any impact on the park uh, um, I can I can communicate that back to council, but uh, right now uh, the region is driving this project Thank you, and may I just suggest if the playground becomes off limits Maybe we can take that opportunity to do the new playground so that the residents don't have to be inconvenienced twice I'll just leave that thought with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank you Councilor Gardner Councilor Peary Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is this the type of activity that would al allow us to charge the region a 6% administration fee? It's a question I can't answer, but perhaps a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Peary. Seeing no more comments on this item, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? That carries, Mr. Clerk. So we'll now move back to item R5. Sir. Mover and a seconder for that item. <coughs> Moved by Councillor Gardner. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Maracas. Comments to this item? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. We'll move to item R6. Is there a mover for this item? Moved by Councillor Humphreys. Seconded by Count or Mayor Daw. There's a comment. Councillor Peary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. The same question I had before, but now to the right item. Um, 
there are some some different name brand locations that are being contemplated uh, on this site. Um, one are those guarantees? Is that something that that they're working on? Um, and I guess my second question is: uh, Are they going to get rid of the bong shop that is uh, operating out of here? A word about bongs, Mr. Mermuno. So you, Mr. Uh, Chair, um, uh, the owner has uh, indicated that they're hoping to get Starbucks, but I don't think there's a. Uh, any uh, guarantee that that's going to happen but we hope they it, it does but um they've they've shown starbucks in that end unit so we'll hope for the best council Perry? that doesn't answer the second question uh, is that, the is job? That, yeah no is that something seriously that uh if we're giving them funds is there any latitude to have a, a discussion do you have an answer for that mr ramuno to you, Mr. Chair, um, it's. Do they intend to? It is within council. To be the tenant mm -hmm. post. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the they're, they're improvement in, program. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is within council's right to uh, uh, to ask that. We we could make that a condition of um, of the of the of the grant. But I mean, it's. Councilor Perry. I understand that the work needs to happen, that this is a, an older building, um, but if you could have that discussion, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Councillor Peary. Is that all? Yes. Councillor Gardner. Thank you. Um, this, Mr. Mino, this is providing, uh, I mean, it's a pretty unattractive strip mall at the moment and they're going to make it look a lot better but I'm assuming because it's pretty unattractive that there are businesses there that are getting a pretty low rent which is nice to have a diversity in the town and also I believe there are rental u rental residential units which are not in good shape so uh, a um, do we have any control over rents? I mean, if if the rent is five hundred dollars a month and they're going to take it up to two thousand because they're doing these improvements, do we have we have no control over that? Mr. Muno, do you, Mr. Chair? Uh, no, we don't have any control over the uh, uh, the rents. There are rental units, residential units on the second floor, is my understanding, but we don't have control over the uh, rents. Do you know if they're going to be improving those units as well, or is it just the the commercial area do you mr. chair no it is in the entire building it's basically a, uh, a refreshing of the exterior facade so restuccoing um, the building removing the old canopies and uh, uh, reinstalling new canopies so it is a an over two hundred thirty thousand uh, dollar improvement to the exterior is uh, what is being uh, indicated to us and the grant that's being applied for under the CIP is uh, fifteen thousand dollars but it's an over $200,000 improvement that the owner is proposing, and it's really all uh, all exterior work. Thank you, and I'm all in favor of improving the look of this, uh, this strip mall. Um, but I'm thinking it's probably going to increase the, the rents of the tenants, and I think if, if there is a bong shop there, which I wasn't aware of, they're probably going to have to find another location. They're not going to be able to afford it. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Councillor Humphreys. Hi, thank you, the Mr. Chair. And uh, no, I'm, I'm happy that they're taking advantage of our, our community improvement grant. I don't want any, any strings attached. I really want this to move forward. I know what you mean. Absolutely. I mean, that may happen anyway, but I think it's uh, going to be a huge improvement. And let's get rid of the eyesore. I'm happy that they're taking advantage of it and hopefully they'll get moving forward quickly. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. Yeah. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Through to Mr. Ramuno. Mr. Ramuno, on page three of the report, first paragraph, it says that the program is intended to encourage private sector property owners to implement improvements to building facings and exterior signage that otherwise may not occur due to cost related issues. So you've said that they're, they're spending $250,000 renovate the entire building so are, are, are 
Is staff proposing the fact that if we don't give them fifteen thousand dollars, the rest of that renovation won't happen? Mr. Ramuno. Uh, no, I to you, Mr. Chair. I don't believe that's the case. But uh, the applicant was, uh, you know, is aware of our uh, program, and you know he has applied. But the maximum grant is fifteen. That that would be eligible would be only fifteen thousand dollars. I guess my point is, is that um, I understand that the intent of the program is to help business owners do this. But if somebody's already going to do a, a complete refresh of the building, are we not almost just giving them fifteen thousand dollars that they would have otherwise spent? Right. I mean, I think there is a time and a place for it. I think you know, if it's a question of getting it done or not getting it done, I think if this council says no, I think the work still gets done. And so. Uh, I would like to see a little bit more of a, uh, some information for next week to give me some assurances that this is absolutely necessary, that this $15,000 grant will make a difference in that work getting done or not. Because if, if it's just us giving a business owner uh, you know, a $15,000 grant to, def to uh, defer some of his costs, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the intent of this program. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Any further comments? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. And uh, great. We'll move to uh, item R nine. Mover and seconder for R9. Moved by Councillor Peary, seconded by Councillor Humphreys. Comments to this item? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. I believe that brings us to the end of our items. Oh, there's two more. Right, of course. So there's C1 and C2. Um, I will go to item C1. Move. Mover and seconder for that. Harold, did you, would you like to move this? Is there a seconder? Moved by Councillor Kim, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Comments to C1. Councillor Kim. Yeah, it's, uh, I recall uh, this my motion that uh, brought this uh, report forward, and uh, at that time we didn't know how Bill 139 would fare and the uh, subsequent planning appeal tribunal. And, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, Bill 139 did uh, receive royal consent. And as uh, Councillor Thompson said earlier, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're all ecstatic about it. We have control over our own destiny. But it was, I thought, uh, it, it was an eye raiser. Uh, it wasn't as, as uh, entirely how I thought, but uh, some of the themes, uh, are there in terms of uh, uh, the trend over the last 10 years, which was, you know, appeals occurred when staff recommendation was uh, was not followed. You know, vast majority of the appeals cases were settled, and you know, th this resulted in you know almost 1.1 million in legal and expert consultant fees. But that was the uh, the, the old OMB regime that we lived in, and uh, we were creatures of that, and unfortunately. You know, those are the things that uh, weighed on us as we made our decision-making process. But I'm happy about uh, the way things uh, have gone uh, in the province, and I look forward to the new regime. And uh, so, so I guess this is the past, and we turn the page. Thank you, Councillor Kim. Councillor Thompson. And just, I think it, you know, it supports what municipalities have been saying all along that, uh, you know, that the OMB needed to be reformed. Uh, I think if you look at some of the stats, and, and granted it's subjective, but it's interesting on page three where it says other planning applications, how many times did we win? Zero. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority were settled. It's subjective, but I would argue that, uh, you know, we're faced with overwhelming odds that some municipalities would choose to settle run, rather than run the risk of losing along the process. But, uh, you, know, I, you know, I asked as well to have this on the report tonight because I just, again, it just reinforces what municipalities have been saying all along that the perception was that the, the odds were stacked against us. I think in the new world now, I think that uh, we've, uh, we've gotten what we've advocated for and uh, hopefully it uh, turns out the way we all think it will. 
Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Seeing no further comments to this item, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Move to item C2. I think that was pulled by Councillor Maracas. Would you like to move that item? Moved by Councillor Maracas, seconded by Councillor Humphreys. Comments to this item? Councillor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Ch Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was just curious, maybe, um, if our regional representative, uh, Mayor Dock, could kind of give us a rationale and, and some of maybe the, the conversation uh, that transpired within the region um, as to why uh, the future interchange at Highway 404 and St. John's Side Road was never, um, never included in the 10-year plan. Yeah, so I think this happened at a previous meeting. I just think that if you want a quick clar clarification answer from the mayor that asking questions is fine, if it's going to get into a debate back and forth, I would I, I'd probably encourage you to perhaps ask your questions, and then if Mayor Daw would like to speak at his full length, could answer them. But I just don't think it's fair to go back and forth, back and forth, or, and whose speaking time is what. So I think if it's minor clerical or clarifications that you're looking for from the mayor, then I think I'll let him answer. But I think if you're looking for a substantive answer, I'd appreciate perhaps letting the mayor have his full time to speak after you're finished speaking. Well, okay. Well, then, uh, I'll, first question was, is what was the rationale for it not being included in the 10-year plan in a construction program? Uh, how did uh, the mayor vote on the 10-year plan with that, without it being included? Uh, and uh, his rationale for the way he voted? Is that all for the first time, Councilor Martin? No, for, for right now, are, the there, are there any further comments? Would the mayor like to respond or Mayor Daw? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the interchange has been and continues to be identified in the master plan. Uh, interchanges are under provincial jurisdiction. It was first identifi identified, and I've got some notes here, in the 2002 Regional Transportation Master Plan with the timing of 2021. Uh, the TMP, the 2009 TMP moved that timing out to 2031. The 2016 TMP uh, moved it to a range of 2027 to 2031, so it actually backed it up a bit. Uh, we continue to advocate for it. Uh, as a matter of fact, the interchange is coming back to the region March or April. So the discussion of that with some other projects to be um, uh, to go back into the uh, the budgetary ten-year capital plan. It was it was put in as an option uh, with the full proviso that it was coming back. So I voted in favor of it coming back. Uh, it's supposed to be first quarter of this year. Thank you, Mayor Dahl. Uh, I have Councillor Thompson. Uh, Mayor Dahl, would you uh, keep council informed of when that report comes back to regional council? Because uh, I know for myself, I'm very interested in that particular issue. I, I'd like to attend that meeting or at least hear the debate about it. Uh, you know, I think we all are, uh, but I'll only speak for myself. Uh, you know, as someone who uh, frequently uses the 404 and, and sees the congestion both uh, on the way uh, in the morning as well as in the evening, uh, I, I can't stress enough how much that is needed sooner rather than later. Um, as we all know, costs continue to escalate, um, you know, and uh, it's better to look at doing it now than waiting, you know, exponentially and seeing the cost rise, especially if I continue to hear that the 404 is getting widened. Uh, you know, at some point, I just think that, you know, do it at the same time. I think some of us share the opinion that it's unfortunate that it wasn't included when, uh, when St. John's was widened. Maybe there was an opportunity to do it then I get it that was the decision made long ago but you know it just would have seemed to be common sense but uh, I would appreciate it if you would uh, keep me and, and, and anyone else on the council informed about what's happening. Thank you Councillor Thompson. I have Councillor Maracas for the second time. Thank you Mr. Chair and I mean the reason I, I, I just brought this up is um, I did meet with the uh, the Minister of Transportation uh, the other day and uh, the conversations uh, at the table with um, with with her and with actually the director of provincial highways uh, mentioned that they they have not uh, had conversations with 
Aurora Town staff since I believe 2013. And, and, and I understand that maybe it was at that time it was uh, pushed off and saying that the region's dealing with this and they don't, you know, we don't necessarily need to get involved. Um, I believe that we do need to get involved and that was some of the, the, the conversations that were going around the table is that they would like to hear from, from us, from the town. And because and, and, they're not understanding that how, how urgent and how much of a need it is. They also mentioned that um, in their conversations with the region, it really isn't being pushed that it's, um, it's that much needed. And so, uh, Mayor Da, if, if, if you could continue to you know, push for this and, and make sure that it gets at, uh, on the table, um, the conversations as well, they mentioned that with the widening, the future widening from Stouffville to Green Lane, they haven't done their detailed designs and now is the time to look at adding this possibly in and they're open to adding this in but they need the region to identify this as this is what the region wants to do and are willing to basically add in some funding and so I think that if we push hard we get our staff involved as well to push on this that maybe we can actually get this done. Thank you Councilor Maracas. Any further comments to this item? Seeing none or oh, we have one more right at the wire. Councilor Thompson. Well, to that point, uh, you know, I'd like to put forward an amendment that uh, that asks staff to uh, to essentially reach out to to the province and express uh, the need for that interchange. You know, I, I get it that it's a uh, it's you know it's in the region's purview, but at the end of the day, if the province is saying, you know, it would be a little helpful if you guys, you know, uh, wrote to us and expressed your your need, then let's do that. Let's be proactive. And, and hopefully that also helps with uh, the region, um, you know, uh, putting a little pressure on them, shall we say. So uh, that's a so long-winded motion. So, so just that, that uh, you know, the staff be directed to, uh, you know, as per Councilor Macker said, uh, write those in the region, uh, not region, in the province uh, with regards to our request and our need for an interchange at St. John's and 404. Is that clear, Mr. Clerk? Is there a second for that amendment? Second by Councillor Peary. Comments or questions to the amendment? I have Councillor Humphreys, Gardner, and Maracas. Are those all to the amendment? No. Or no. yours is to the amendment. Is yours to the amendment, Councillor Gardner? No. So yours is to the main motion, and is yours to the main motion? I can actually ask the amendment. So you want to talk about the amendment? Yes. Councillor Humphreys, to the amendment? Uh, to the amendment, uh, I think that's great. And is, there, is this the right protocol? Can we also do this and include our local MP that is our representative for provincial government to ask him to put on his agenda. And our staff would absolutely meet with them, him, and uh, I don't S know who. Excuse me for interrupting, Councillor Humphreys, but we need a motion to extend. So it's but to 11 o'clock, correct? A motion to extend, uh, Mayor Daw, seconded by Councillor Kim. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Continue, Councillor Humphreys. And in particular, I think the Minister of Transportation, I think, isn't that what our local MP? Local, yeah, so. Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyway, I think it's a good uh, thing to add to uh, the section to add to this motion as we have a close relationship with our local MP and we can ask to advocate in that direction as well. Make part of the agenda. We go direct plus MP. Great. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. Councillor Maracas to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was just going to add to that. I mean, it's great to have it on and, and actually have it as a direction and, and pass it as a council to say to do this. Just wanted for information to Councillor Thompson and to the rest that I did pass along the information to our CAO uh, and and also to, um, I believe I, did I give it to you, Mr. Oh, Mr. Ramono as well, the um, the card of the regional, um, sorry, the uh, the director of provincial highways. Uh, he's the one that asked that that staff get in contact with him. So I did provide them with those numbers. And if we give that direction, I'm sure they were going to do it anyways. But I think it just makes it more formal for us to give that direction to them and to reach out. And they're they're he's waiting to hear from them. Thank you, Council Maracas. Any comments to the amendment? Seeing none, I'll call the vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? Mm -hmm. Amendment carries. Back to the main motion as amended. I have Councillor Gartner to speak for the first time. Councilor Thank you. Well, I was just going to, uh, maybe it doesn't have to be an amendment, but it could that um, we want to support 
Meridal lobbying the region. So maybe as a council, we also need to uh, send a letter to the region saying how important it is because of our expanding population and the traffic congestion that we have. That's up to. Uh, well, the amendment already passed, Council Gardner. So. No, but we have we included a, a council also. We've we the, the amendment was for we, staff. We, 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 I think I think it's staff was to reach out to the province, so you'd like them to reach out to the region as well. Is that what you're asking? Fine. I think that would be a friendly amendment. Uh, uh, it doesn't hurt. I thought it might help the mayor if he knew his council was 100 percent behind. Sure. This initiative. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Well, I'll call the vote on this item as there are no more speakers. All those in favor? As amended? Opposed? That carries unanimously. All right, that concludes the items for discussion. We'll move to new business. I'll start with Councillor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to, the, to our clerk, um, with being 2018, being an election year, uh, I'm, and there was new legislation uh, with Bill 181, uh, the Municipal Elections Moder Modernization Act uh, that, uh, that passed, and there's a, a lot of new pieces to the legislation and a lot of changes uh, when it comes to third-party advertising, uh, when it comes to basically uh, contributions, donations. And so I'm, I'm wondering, it might be in the best interest of, of this council and for the public uh, that maybe we, we get a report from you that details what is allowed, uh, what, what changes have, have occurred, and also maybe if we could include, I think, um, our changes to our election signs by law for the town of Aurora as well. Uh, maybe have a, a map showing where they can go and just to get everyone up to speed and I think that this would be important to come uh, as a report uh, to council and for the public to see before May 1st when nominations open up and if that's possible that would be great. Mr. Clerk. Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Councilor Marcus. We're, we're planning on doing something shortly um, with the new um, uh, regulations per the uh, the changes uh, from the provincial government and I believe um, we'll be doing a separate report to on the sign by law we do have to make a few amendments with third-party advertising rules so um, and we'll uh, include a map too and, uh, and things like that to help uh, residents and, and for future future candidates thank you and th thank you mr. chair um, and just one more question uh, will we also be seeing and I'm, I'm, I'm I believe I spoke to the CAO about this but will we be getting a report soon on um, the original motion back uh, when we first started this term that I put forward uh, when we did make those changes to the sign bylaw for election signs uh, in regards to the enforcement piece that we, we, we deferred to 2018. Will that be coming before May 1st? Mr. Clerk or yeah. Mr. CAO, I don't know who's yeah. best equipped. Taysha, perhaps? Ms. Van Leeuwen, I should say. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, yes, that will be incorporated into uh, the report that includes the, the revisions for the signed bylaw. I know it's a future pending um, item. Uh, it's on the pending list as a future consideration, so we will include that. Uh, Councilor Maragas? Thank you. I appreciate it, and that's all for now. Excellent. Councilor Gardner, you had a motion you wish to make earlier? I do, but may I ask uh, through you to Mr. Muno. Mr. Muno, what is our public planning uh, meeting for February looking like? I, I believe uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we do have uh, one, if not two items scheduled, but I'll have to, I'll have to confirm that. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, this, Okay, that uh, this is the motion. Okay, Mr. Clerk. That council hold a public meeting to receive input on suggested changes to zoning bylaws that would make them more protective and in keeping with our official plan policies. That comments be re will also that comments also be accepted by any appropriate means, including written email or media not social media of course and um, that the current zoning bylaw be made easily available online through email request or by hard copy 
and that this meeting be held at the end of February. So the end of February was to be in keeping with the public planning meeting, but I, I think uh, if we already have two items that that may not work. So maybe you could suggest some dates to us for next week. Well, Councilor Garner, I may have two suggestions. One is perhaps, uh, it seemed like you had this, uh, maybe sending it to the clerk in advance, would it be helpful to the speed of the process? But anyhow, now that you've made the motion, I just have a question. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, but I, I Did didn't think of it. <laughs> the meeting? Okay, sorry, just so, a typical practice that we- I mean, I didn't think of it till this meeting. Thank okay, you. no problem then. I just think it's typical practice to send it in advance. So it's uh, I agree. Process. It's more respectful. Um, mm -hmm. I don't believe our council com council calendar is full for the first two weeks of March because March break occurs in the second week of March. So perhaps the first week of March would be a good time, not that far after the end of February. We have no council meeting scheduled for the first two weeks. Um, I'm, I'm maybe we could think on that till next week because the, the, I mean, a lot of our residents are able to go away for March break. It would be the week before. So March breaks, is, I believe, uh, the second week of March, and the first week of March is also free from meetings. But right. I, I, um, I think that's just what I've noticed, but perhaps staff can recommend it. No, I, I think you're right. I'm just thinking that uh, I'd like to check with at least a few residents in different areas because I think sometimes they go away for longer than that week. Sure. Thank you. So just to be clear then, the motion it includes the date or does not include the date? The motion, it says that the meeting to be held at the end of February, but I mean, this is a motion that's gonna go forward to council, so it could be adjusted. Okay, so it could be the end of February, the beginning of March. Depends how the public planning meeting uh, pans out and is that, is that okay? So just for clarification, the, the full motion is that there is a public meeting to review uh, for public input for review of or any possible changes to the zoning bylaw and that this meeting be taken place at the end of February or beginning of March? That's correct. You have that, Mr. Clerk? Is there a seconder for that? As it relates to stable neighborhoods. Thank you. That would be helpful to put it in the motion. Okay. So the clerk has indicated that they have the intent of the motion. I know, I have it written so I'll. Okay. And Councillor Humphreys is seconding it. We have a, a speaker to the amendment in, or the motion is Councillor Maracas. Unless, Councillor Gardner, would you like to speak to it first and then? Okay, Councillor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll probably speak maybe a little bit to it more next week, depending on what information we get as far as the date. Um, but I think the date is crucial because, I mean, we're hearing that Mr. Ramon is gonna come back with the study, with a report, possibly end of March, April um, so I think having a open house or a informational session with the public in March wouldn't really uh, like I think it would be a bit late to get those comments and to kind of make adjustments to any report that Mr. Ramon is doing so I, I think February is probably the most optimal time to, to receive those comments from Mr. Ramon to include them in whatever changes or whatever recommendations he makes so that's just want to make that one comment. Yeah, I think my comment was only, I think I misunderstood Councillor Gardner's initial request because I thought she was tying it to either a, a, an existing council meeting or not, but if it's just gonna be an open house, then maybe staff can just come back with the best date. I think it makes sense. Any further comments to the motion? Um, Councillor Gardner? I'd just like to think on it till next week because I don't know what the best, and speak to the clerk and perhaps with your CEO because I don't know what the best format would be. This is pretty formal. And I don't know if that's how we want to hold this kind of public meeting. So, yeah. I think when staff review the motion, perhaps when we come back to council for next week, that we can look at it then and they'll make a recommendation. Okay, thanks. All those in favor of uh, this? Opposed? Could it? Yeah, it's a Could recommendation to come back. I, that passes. I, I would. I would like to. I would appreciate hearing from members who didn't vote for it. Why? What improvements could be made? I'm not. Perhaps I, not now. I think but everyone voted for it. No, no. The, 
I think Paul Peary, Mr. Peary clarified. Mr. Peary. Mr. Peary. Councillor Peary. Councillor Peary with a beard. I think he asked for clarification as the vote was taking place, and it, it's just that it was coming back to next week because okay. we don't right. make motions at committee. Thank we'll, you. It'll be, it'll be coming back to council. Um, yeah. So that passes, Mr. Right. Clerk. Um, any more new business, Councillor Gardner? Oh, I do have something. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed, but the lack of accessible washrooms on the second floor of the library went viral. Nobody, nobody, apparently nobody. Um, and was picked up by David Lepofsky, who is one of the major accessibility, um, um, whatever he, I won't say lobbyist, I don't know exactly what he is, but he is a lawyer and he has accessibility issues and he is an authority. And anyway, so um, I'm not sure who this would be addressed to. Uh, the, we got the, re the report from the Accessibility Advisory Committee that they did recommend that uh, approval of their plan for 2018. So I would just like to make sure that this is on the plan and um, that it comes to us sooner as opposed to later, because I don't really think that's how Aurora wants to be known. Mr. C. Are you looking for a comment? Any idea who would? <laughs> uh, a question. Is, who is our acting accessibility advisor? Mr. CAO. Mr. CAO, then. No, no, I'm asking him oh. to respond to your answer. <laughs> Um, I just is it Ivy? It's Ivy. She's okay. acting uh, while we're, but we have posted the, or we will be shortly posting uh, uh, the job. And is, is Ivy, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, is Ivy under your department? Ms. Van Leeuwen? So, so through you, Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair could, Ms., could Ms. Van Leeuwen please ask uh, our, our acting, um, I don't know Ivy's last name, uh, Ivy Hendricks. Our staff, Ivy Hendrickson, if this washroom is on the 2018 plan and when the ask is going to come to us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Councillor Thompson, new business. Councillor Humphreys. I do have something. Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. Um, relative to the issue that Ms. Buckles came forward tonight, are there, is there going to be any actions coming out of that? Her concern, I mean, we heard that fire escape problems and everything else. Are we going to do anything? Are we able to? Who would Anybody? you like to address your question well, to? Byla. Ms. Van Leeuwen, do you have a comment? Just get a pretty bad situation. Through you, Mr. Chair. This is a difficult situation. Um, this fence was erected lawfully. The posts we have identified to be two to four inches over the height. The property owner at 43 Wells has agreed to contact her fence contractor and have the posts uh, shaved so that they're in compliance. Um, in terms of safety and fire escapes and the building code, this actually, there, you only need one exit and that is your front door from uh, a single family dwelling. If there's a second story, there's some provisions around window size, but this is not an unsafe situation from an exit situation. Uh, so in terms of what we can do, there is a notice of motion that was on tonight's agenda as an add-on uh, to review our fence bylaw going forward. Will it enable us to order the property owner at 43 Wells to remove the fence? No, it will not. The fence has been lawfully erected and a survey was uh, retained to survey the property line. The, actual, the stakes are still visible and the fence is on her property. Okay. In terms, of, sure, that's fine. I, I mean, it, it, but in terms of now trying to get the red tagged, what's, what's she going to do? I mean, it sounds like she needs to remove the fence, but she can't. Right? Like she, consumers, well, whoever, consumers, gas, wow, Enbridge or whoever. whoever um, red tagged, you know, everything, and they've got to get there. So now what happens? Just nothing from our perspective? It's not our problem? 
Ms. Van Leeuwen, is there a provision? Just needs to ask the question because I, she keeps coming, you know, she's coming to town to ask for help. So I'd like to say your best bet is to go, you know, feel sorry for the situation. It's, inc it's incredible. Do you have any further questions of staff? I'm just wondering what, we have no jurisdiction? Is that what? I don't mind hearing the straight answer. I answer from staff. If Ms. Van Leeuwen or the CAO would like to. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do, I guess, but just need to let her know that. Mr. CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as far as I know, uh, there is a mechanism within the existing bylaw that allows for this situation, and but it's not a, it's not a town issue per se in that um, the resident that needs the fence taken down has to, has to notify the, the homeowner that owns the fence that they require access. That access can't be withheld, but the but the burden in terms of cost and so on falls to the person who needs the fence moved. So wow. that's, that's the way the rules are now. And uh, so we don't really have any way to, to uh, require anybody to change that at this stage. Okay. okay. Councillor Humphreys? That's all, thanks. Yeah. Councillor Thompson? Thank you. I just wanna get some further clarification from Ms. Van Leeuwen on, on uh, what Councillor Humphreys brought up. Um, in your explanation, you talked about a couple times that the, the fence was lawfully erected, uh, but you know I, I've heard from the the homeowner that uh, from her perspective, she feels that there's a responsibility on the town's part because the town approved the fence. And I'm hoping if you can expand and explain a little bit more detail uh, whether we approved it or not, and what's involved in that approval. As we saw earlier in, in planning applications, you know often we get. Uh, site plans, uh, you know, people go out and, and inspect it, and, and there's a pr an approval process with that. And and so I'd like to know what exactly did we approve, and what did we know? Ms. Van Leeuwen. Through you, Mr. Chair, a permit is not required for a fence unless it is a pool enclosure fence. Um, so approval from the town is not required. We do have a bylaw that regulates the height of a fence, and dependent on location, if it's in your front yard or if it's in your side yard or rear yard, there's different height requirements, commercial versus uh, residential properties, there's different height requirements. But uh, uh, approval from the town is not required for the erection of a fence. So we responded to uh, the complaint of this fence um, when Ms. Buckles approached council in the fall and that's when we went out and we did an inspection and we've measured the fence and we have identified that the posts are anywhere between two and four inches over the maximum height, but the top rail of the fence is not. So we have contacted the, the property owner uh, who constructed the fence and she has agreed to um, reduce the height of the posts for compliance. And, you know, I, I, I understand that these questions don't resolve the issue, but i just like to understand how it occurred in the first place. So just um, through your explanation, just to be clear, prior to the fence being erected, the town had no awareness that this was happening. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. New business, Mr. Mayor? Councillor Kim, new business? Yes. Um, I forgot to mention this uh, in the last calendar year, but uh, with the budget uh, for 2017 gone, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Councillor Thompson for leading the Finance uh, Advisory Committee yeah. another year. I know uh, I've ridden uh, his coattails uh, a few times, <laughs> and I appreciate it. And so I, I pr appreciate uh, his leadership on it, and I uh, look forward to the final few months uh, of this term uh, working with uh, Councillor Thompson and uh, the mayor and staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kim. Councillor Peary. That concludes new business. We have no closed session, so will someone move adjournment? Moved by Councillor Maracas, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out.